call to order this regular meeting of the Scottsdale Unified School District's Governing Board. The date is January 15th and the time is 5.04. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Vice President Beckham, would you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, We will have a roll call starting from my far right. Jan Michael Greenberg. Sandy Kravitz. Allison Beckham. And Patty Beckman. All board members are present except for board member Perleberg, and she will be here shortly. We do have a quorum. Okay, we will move right to agenda item three, approval of the agenda. Are there any requests to amend the agenda? No? Nope. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, board member Beckham seconds the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes four to zero. All right, now we call upon Dr. Creekard to present the student staff recognitions and celebrations. Thank you, President Beckman, members of the board. Uh, we have three celebrations this evening to share with you, and I would like to first of all start with Dr. Melissa Sackos, Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education. Good evening, President Beckman, Governing Board members, Dr. Creekart and Sandra. Last fall, Tonalia K-8 teamed up with Arizona State University and our Scottsdale Public Arts community to work on a project that became um, part of the Canal Convergence event in Old Town Scottsdale in November. I'd like to introduce Tonalia Principal Dr. David Perninsky and some of his friends to tell us a little bit more about this project. Thank you. Governing board members, President Beckman, Dr. Kuykard, Sandra and guests, my name is Dave Pernisky, proud principal of Tonalia K-8. I'm also joined by some of our Tonalia teachers. We have Ms. Campini, Mrs. Solberg, and Dr. Slamowitz with us, as well as our students to celebrate our work last fall at the Canal Convergence Project in Old Town Scottsdale. I'd also like to thank, we have two members from the Scottsdale Center for the Arts who are in the audience as well. Uh, Christine Harthoon and Natalie Marsh, thank you for coming tonight, um, who helped us significantly with this project last fall. Uh, the convergence took place uh, November 8th through 17th. It drew artists and designers from all over the world, including our very own Tunnelia artists and designers, um, some of our homegrown talent here in Scottsdale. Early this fall, teachers and students met monthly uh, with Arizona State University graduate students from the Herberger Design Studio at ASU to learn more about the design process. This year's theme was titled The Story of Water. From here, Tonali and ASU students came up with the idea of showcasing monsoons, which inspired the installation named Cumulus for this project. The installation was designed and built with 125 Tonali students 30 ASU graduate students and installed next to the Solari Bridge in Old Town Scottsdale on November 8th. I'd like to welcome Dr. Slamowitz, one of our teachers who helped facilitate uh, this project with our students. So our partnership was our school, Tonalia K-8, along with Arizona State University and Scottsdale Center for the Arts. This is a video that kind of just shows you how our projects are going to turn into patterns. On this 
this slide will show you how all the patterns that our students at Tonalia K-8 developed and helped ASU and the Scottsdale Center for the Arts to develop their project that was showcased at the Canal Convergence Project. So as you can see, this is one of our designs. This is actually from my homeroom, and it turned into the pattern on the left. This is another pattern. It turned into the raindrops. And when you went over to the Canal Convergence Project, if you scan the patterns with your phone, you would see actually original inspiration quotes, photos, and videos from our own Scottsdale Unified School District students at Tonalia K-8. I'm going to welcome up Giabella Jordan to speak about the project as a student. Governing board members, thank you for inviting us to celebrate our work. It was a very cool project which inspired us to build and design with the ASU students. On Friday, the ASU students came to Tonalia, and my favorite project that we did was when they put us in groups to make a monsoon. One group was a group of kids making the sound of thunder. One group of kids was making animal noises. Another group was making a light rain sound. And then the last group was making tornado sounds. It sounded like a real monsoon in our classroom. These activities helped design the installation of the Solari Bridge. We also got to visit Arizona State University on a field trip. Although I want to study medicine and become a doctor one day at ASU, the trip to the design studio at ASU was very cool. Also, we got to eat really good food at the ASU cafeteria. Thank you. Hello, fellow governing board members. I'm part of the Tonalia K-8 school. And I just wanted to say that the ASU brought us all together and united us together through this adventure and experience that we had. We, they opened a complex region in our brain that we never thought we had inside of us. And we thought like a child after all of these years again. And I would just like to say that ASU did an amazing job through, through this project. Can we give it up for our students? Wow, that's impressive. Thank you to all of you, Arizona State University and Scottsdale Center for the Arts for making this a uh, wonderful learning opportunity for our students and to help their design come to life um, at the Canal Convergence. Our second celebration this evening is with our JAG program, Jobs for Arizona Graduates. Um, and the JAG program is here at our very own Coronado High School. JAG is a uh, college and career, oh, here we go, Ford River Kravitz, we can take it, let's do it. JAG is a college and career preparation program offered to juniors and seniors. Here to tell you more about the state and national winning program at Coronado High School is Principal Amy Palatucci, accompanied by JAG lead teacher Wendy Paez Gonzalez and some of her amazing students. Ms. Palatucci. Yes, thank you, Dr. Sackos. And I just want to say I'm super excited about all those future dons that were just up here. Um, Madam President, members of the board, tonight I'm joined by my fabulous teacher, Ms. Wendy Paez, and her students to tell you a little bit about JAG and an award she won. Um, I'm honored to share that the Job for Arizona Graduate Program, also known as JAG, is a college and career preparation pro program offered to juniors and seniors at Coronado High School. This program helps students explore college and career while working on leadership development skills, service learning, civic engagement, social awareness, and personal growth. JAG is a class, a club, and a program all rolled into one. JAG has gained national rec recognition, and just today there was an awesome magazine in Forbes magazine that I'll be tweeting out later um, to read all about the wonderful program and the work that our students do. So to talk about Ms. What Wendy Paez, for the past eight years, Ms. Wendy Paez Gonzalez has been the JAG coordinator at Coronado High School. During her first year, she worked tire tirelessly to uphold the values of the JAG mission of getting her students to graduate on time and be prepared for post-secondary life. In her first year as JAG program coordinator at Coronado, she won first place as best JAG program in the state of Arizona. For the past eight years, the Coronado JAG program has placed either first or second for program of the year and career association in the state competitions. Ms. Paez has also won Outstanding JAG Coordinator for the state of Arizona for four years. 
She has been asked to teach at the National Training Seminar, where she has received awards for her work. The JAG program has won several national awards over the years, and this year we were honored to receive the Five of Five Award, which they brought with them tonight. This is an award given to JAG programs who meet or exceed all five JAG standards. This award measures the success of the students who graduated the previous year. An additional success of the program was having four young ladies join the state leadership team for JAG. These ladies not only represented Coronado, but the state of Arizona at the National Student Leadership Conference in Washington, DC. Ms. Paez continues to work hard to achieve JAG goals every day, and we hope you will support them when they go to state competition in April. Go JAG. Thank you, Principal Palatucci, Ms. Paez Gonzalez, and our amazing JAG students. We are so proud of your accomplishments and your commitment to uh, post high school success and readiness. Next, I'd like to welcome up Dr. Steve Nance, our Assistant Superintendent for Educational Services for our next presentation. Good evening, President Beckman, board members, Dr. Creekhard, and Sandra. The National Board Certification is designed to develop, retain, and recognize accomplished teachers and to generate ongoing improvement in schools nationwide. It is the most respected professional certification available in K-12 education. Created by teachers, for teachers, National Board standards represent a consensus among educators about what accomplished teachers should know and be able to do. I'd like to introduce Ingleside Middle School physical education teacher Susan Leonard, our lead National Board certified teacher who heads up Scottsdale's NBCT training team. So Susan, come on up. Good evening, President Beckman, board members, Dr. Creekhard and Sandra. National board certification is a voluntary process that takes one to three years to complete. It requires teachers to demonstrate standards-based evidence of the positive effect they have on student learning in alignment with the five core propositions. They must exhibit a deep understanding of their students, content knowledge, use of data, assessments, and teacher practice. They must also show they participate in learning communities and provide evidence of ongoing reflection and continuous learning. I am proud to say that Arizona currently ranks 18th nationally with a number of MBCTs with specifically 1,460. I'm even more proud to share that Scottsdale Unified School District is at or, is at or near the top of all Arizona school districts on a very consistent basis. Tonight, we are here to celebrate one new and four renewed MBCTs in SUSD. I believe the fact that we have four out of the total 50 um, renewals in the state of Arizona is evidence our teachers not only achieve certi certification, we are motivated to maintain the highest standard of learning for ourselves and our students. Would the following accomplished teachers please come up and be recognized? Kyle Bragg, Anna Saza Elementary. Carrie Miller, Laguna Elementary. Diane Murphy, SUSD Curriculum and Professional <laughs> Development. Kimberly Vallejo, Copper Ridge. And Wes Wagner from Ingleside Middle School was unable to be, with, be here with us this evening, but he did renew his certification. Now I'm going to brag on these people a little bit. Kyle is our new... MBCT teacher this year and one of our youngest. 
You may remember him from a recent governing board meeting in which he was recognized as Arizona Elementary Physical Education Teacher of the Year. Kyle is in his eighth year of teaching and his third in SUSD. He received his bachelor's degree in physical education from Illinois State University in 2010 and his master's degree in teaching and learning from Nova Southeastern University in 2013. Carrie Miller teaches second grade at Laguna Elementary. She began teaching in 2002 and is a graduate of Grand Canyon University with a bachelor's in science and elementary education and University of Phoenix with a master's in arts degree in curriculum and instruction. Carrie also has several education endorsements including English, English as a second language, early childhood and middle grade language arts. Diane Murphy has been an SUSD English language arts academic coach for the past 21 years and currently coaches our pre-K and fifth grade teachers. She earned her teaching degree from the University of Kansas and her master's degree in curriculum instruction from ASU. And in case you're wondering, she'll be rooting for Kansas City Chiefs this Sunday. <laughs> Kim Vallejo was born and raised in Scottsdale and proudly attended Pueblo, Mojave, and Saguaro High School. She earned her bachelor's degree from Grand Canyon University and first started teaching in SUSD at Ho Holcomb Elementary. A master's degree from Northern Arizona University followed, then as an English as a Second Language endorsement from ASU. In 2001, Kim transferred to the newly built Copper Ridge School, at which she now serves as elementary grades gifted specialist and accelerated math teacher. And even though Wes isn't here, I'm still going to brag on him a little bit. He's from my school. Wes Wagner started teaching at Ingleside Middle School in 2002. He earned his undergraduate degree from ASU in secondary English education and a graduate degree from NAU in education curriculum and instruction. He is a past recipient of Ingleside S Scottsdale Charles Teacher of the, uh, sorry, Educator of the Year Award, as well as the Arizona Middle Level Association Educator Team That Makes a Difference Award. He teaches eighth grade language arts at Ingleside. I would like to take a moment to recognize our district candidate support providers. These fellow MBTs are tirelessly and are the driving force for much of our success of our candidate program. Could you please come up and stand with your fellow MBCTs? Tammy Andreas, Cochise Elementary. Yay. Abby Bobbitt, Laguna Elementary. Yay. And Bobby Faulkner. Mary Gonzalez is also a candidate support provider, a CSP in our district, um, but she was unable to be here this evening. But I'd like to take a moment to point out that Bobby and Mary are retired SUSD teachers who continue to be so passionate about the quality of instruction in our classrooms that they still volunteer their time to help train our teachers. Finally, we would like to thank you, the governing board, the SUSD Foundation, the Arizona K-12 Center, and the Scottsdale Charles for your continued unwavering support of our teachers in the national board process. Thank you. So before, before you go anywhere, I'd also like to thank Susan for her part in this and I'd like to present her with one of our outstanding leadership certificates as well. So thank you, Susan. And just a point of pride on my part, Carrie Miller, who's standing right over here, has come a long way. 30 years ago, Carrie was a student when I was an elementary principal in the Gilbert School District, so it's fun to watch her grow through the years. It's been a long time, hasn't it, Carrie? Scottsdale Classrooms and our students excel because of teachers like you and the other 79 National Board Certified Teachers in our district. So thank you once again to Susan and congratulations to all of you. Do we have any further celebrations or recognitions? For the record, uh, uh, Board Member Perleberg has joined us. Yes. And now we call upon Dr. Creekard to present the superintendent's comments. Thank you, President Beckman, members of the board, Sandra. Uh, tonight's comments, I would like to follow the, the lead of the governor and others uh, who at this time of the year generally give the state of their organization. So I would like to make a few comments tonight regarding how I see the state of the district. 
I came to this position on May 14th of 2018. Think about from where we have come. At that time, we were embroiled in lawsuits. There was a lack of trust and confidence in the district. And that next night, May 15th, 27 people spoke in call to the public. Tonight we have cards for three. What have we accomplished? So during those months, administratively, we hired four of the five assistant superintendents, two high school principals, a director of assessment, and our communications and marketing director. We gave salary raises that continues to put our district in the top one third of comparable districts in terms of teacher salaries. We had a board retreat confirming the team's commitment to academic achievement and core values. We completed a procurement review and acknowledged the written procedures that are now available to all administrators in iVision. We completed a review of the Human Resources Department. We completed a transportation inventory review. We hired a demographer and presented a demographic study so that we would have a picture of what our future will hold in terms of enrollment. We completed a district-wide climate survey. We completed both certified and classified employee handbooks. At the last meeting, we were presented with our new communications and marketing plan. The board designated Cherokee Elementary School as the next construction project and hired an architect to lead that effort. The board voted to rebuild Navajo Elementary School, which by the way is another point of pride after Navajo suffered, suffered that tragic fire on August 22nd, the students of Navajo missed only one day of school. The team in this district pulled together and made sure that those students would continue with their learning on the very next day. We developed a data metrics tool that will be used in the future to continue to guide our progress in terms of student achievement and other district goals. We reestablished the Scottsdale Parent Council and we did technology upgrades for security in every one of our schools. So, though, some of those were the administrative achievements, some of them, not all of them. You know, there's always a great risk when you start naming things that you forget something. We also had program initiatives. We developed the self-contained gifted programs at Kiva Elementary School. We provided training in STEM education for Navajo and Laguna. We designated resources to the AP and IB program for training and supplies. We reallocated dual enrollment funds to schools so that they can develop by complex their PD plans. We also reallocated results-based funding that comes to us from the state so that it has more impact on the individual schools. We trained the Coronado Complex in a unique concept known as family engagement with schools that I've already seen some of the results of that training in more effective and more collaborative family engagements at the schools. And by the way, we updated 14 board policies during the year. And what's in motion? What, what are the ongoing things that we have? Along with the climate survey, we are using the results of that along with the Arizona Youth Survey of 2018 and our own log of discipline referrals to continue to build on the social and emotional health of our students. 
We are expanding the IB program with the primary years program at Anasazi. We have a continued commitment to the Coronado Success Initiative and the Coronado Learning Community Success Initiative that you will hear more about this evening. We have given our support to the Saguaro Math and Science Academy. We have four schools that have growth plans instead of just simply closing but allowing the community to come together and work on growth. Anasazi, Echo Canyon, Navajo, and Yavapai. We have an ongoing administrative salary schedule to try to do away with some of the disparities we have as well as make sure that our administrative salaries are as competitive with our neighboring districts as our teacher salaries are. We continue to train all administrators in the McCrell Balanced Leadership Research. We started just this month an aspiring administrators cadre for training future leaders in the district. And an exciting project we are in the process of developing innovation centers at Saguaro High School and Coronado High School, which is a partnership with our Career Tech Ed Department, the Scottsdale Unified School District Foundation, and with students in our CAD classes in those two high schools helping to develop the place. So where are we going? One of the main objectives every year is to make sure that we develop a balanced budget that reflects our current enrollment and enrollment projections while still supporting teaching and learning. We will work continually to work collaboratively with teachers and staff. A focus that I have had, I believe, through my career that we are re-emphasizing something that Scottsdale was, has long been known for and that is exceptional instruction. But we will focus on not only the academic instruction that is so important on a day-to-day -day basis, but also on how that fits in with the growing need that we have in our schools and in our society for social emotional growth. I'm a firm believer that academic achievement promotes emotional self-esteem. There are issues that some of our students bring to schools that we cannot resolve just through academic achievement. And we will commit resources to help resolve those issues. But a lot of how kids feel about themselves can be handled through instruction through learning. We all know that when we learn something new, we feel pretty good about ourselves. And the same is certainly true about our students. And most of the time, that means that the instruction on a day-to-day -day basis should be engaging, collaborative, rigorous, and fulfilling. Formative assessment is a key. We always need to know. How do we know they know? And what do we do if they don't? That is so key to the instruction. I believe that there are many programs out there that we could buy that will tell us this is how you bring about social emotional health. This is how we bring about kids being better engaged in their schools. And I say, let's do it through the classroom every day, all year long. Engage our students, connect our students to the schools, to the fine adults that we have that we have witnessed tonight, so that they feel connected to something larger and feel fulfilled in that their efforts produce fine results in terms of their own achievement. In the meantime, I have told the district office executive leadership team that I want the district office 
to focus on support of the schools. We are there as a district office to support schools because the teaching and learning act that occurs in the schools is the only thing that we are about. What do, what's our business? We educate. And all of this, I pledge that we will maintain an environment of professionalism and respect. We are on the verge in Scottsdale of, I believe, some great things. We have many great programs, many great teachers, wonderful kids that come to us every day. If we stay focused on the instruction, on professionalism, on the whole child, the sky's the limit. I'm looking forward to helping Scottsdale move forward uh, through my tenure here at least. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Creecard. We are moving on to agenda item six, information and discussion items. A, update on the Coronado Learning Community Success Initiative Plan. Thank you, President Beckman. I would like to call on Dr. Hagigat and uh, others that she will have in doing the presentation as, without taking the risk of maybe uh, stealing a little bit of the thunder. But th the idea is when we initiated this year the, the Coronado Learning Community Success Initiative is that there uh, are two tracks, two parallel tracks, if I can uh, paraphrase former board member Ms. Hartman, and that is we must take care of the Coronado High School students and the gaps that are in their learning for whatever reason and help get them ready to graduate from high school. But we also must have a long range plan and that is to help the elementary and middle schools in that complex to also prepare their students so that Coronado will be able to uh, take them even further on that path. So this is a community wide effort. So with that, as soon as we are ready. Dr. Hagi got. <laughs> How about if we just take the title page and we'll show it? Thank you. Good evening, uh, President Beckman, members of the board, Dr. Creecard and Sandra. Last semester, you were, you were given information regarding the Coronado Success Initiative. Uh, the presentation including data that highlighted academic deficiencies and provided an overview of plans for continuous improvement specific to students grade 9 through 12. This presentation does not focus on data, as it is clear to all that we do need to work together to improve instruction. At the beginning of the 2018-2019 school year, a team of district and K-12 administrators from the Coronado Learning Community acknowledged the need to work as a learning community to address the social, emotional, and academic needs of all students. The plan addresses two areas simultaneously. The first area includes a core district team composed of members from the Teaching and Learning Department the assistant superintendents for secondary and elementary engaging in conversations at individual meetings with each principal to address individual site needs. These meetings led to the refinement of tier one best instruction at each site. The second area includes all the principals from each Coronado Learning Community School and the district core team. The goal was to find best practices that can be implemented at each school to create a unified approach to teaching and learning in an effort to increase rigor and to decrease those gaps cost within a system. During this presentation, you will see the evidence-based high yield instructional strategies that the team selected to address the needs of all students by creating a solid foundation in K-8 
that will increase academic proficiency for students entering their high school years at Coronado. So as you can see, our purpose here includes the alignment of that continuous improvement plans for each school within the Coronado community, and we also wanted to make sure that we were identifying those yield instructional strategies um, and family engagement to increase student achievement. Objectives, we have six objectives here, which the first one was to identify priority areas. We wanted to make sure that these areas had consistency across the entire learning community within each school. We wanted to provide that professional development training in those identified areas, establish time for articulation between the sites. Also, we wanted to make sure that there was alignment of effective practices we wanted to use classroom walkthroughs and intervention planning teams. We want to make a smooth transition if students were to transfer from one school to another within that learning community. And common language across the Coronado learning community was also key for us. What I'd like to do is to introduce Ms. Debbie Ibarra at this time as she will work with us and guide us through this learning community areas of focus with more detail. Good evening, President Beckman, board members, Dr. Creekhart, Sandra, cabinet and board and community members. It's my privilege to get to talk to you about what we've done so far. So we sat down and we had a discussion and another discussion and another discussion and another discussion so that we made sure that these three areas that you're looking at up on your presentation were the three areas that all of the elementary principals, K-8, all the way through we're in agreement with. So when you look at the first one, the Marzano 9 High Yield Strategies, in a few minutes I'm gonna show you the next presentation. They actually sat down and we talked about what was important to each site so that we had a common language going between each school. We felt that when students move from one site to another site, when they go to the high school, there's a common language and everybody understands exactly what is expected out of them, <coughs> along with not only the principals, but the teachers are presenting the material. So we started off with the high yield, then we went to the thinking processes, and thinking processes is thinking maps. And I don't know if any of you had the privilege of going through a high school or through an elementary, had your children go through an elementary that did thinking maps. Thinking maps is a process that all of us use to this day. I use it when I'm about to write an agenda for somebody, or when my poor children were going to college and we were sitting down writing their thesis before to enter into college, it was like, well, let's do a circle map and let's change it to a bubble map. We went through the whole process so that they would understand. They got a little tired of it, but it works. It actually gets your thoughts put together. Also, it works across the curriculum in math and social studies and science, and that's the exciting thing. So the last thing was family engagement that we introduced. And we had a gentleman from Scholastic Education by the name of Ron Mir. And this gentleman came and did a presentation for us, and Dr. Perninsky is going to talk to you about it. And it was taking it the next step. It no longer can be just parent involvement. We have to get it to become family engagement. So here are the nine Marzano strategies. The principals, when we started doing this training, we thought it was really important that we sent the principals to the training first. So Steve Williamson from Teaching and Learning did the presentation for the principals so that they understood what their teachers were gonna go through and what the expectation was when they walked into the classroom and what they were gonna be able to start seeing. And so he has gone through two trainings so far. One's been with the K through two, and the other one's been through three through five. He's asked them to get on Google Docs and put pictures of how they've implemented into their classrooms. He's introduced it to the principals. He's put it out there for all the teachers to be able to start sharing their information. And tomorrow's the first time that we bring back the three through fifth grade teachers, and they're gonna actually present the, what they've done in their classrooms. They're gonna have time to articulate and sit there and discuss all the information that they've done so far. So we're very excited about because when you look at the Marzano 9 and you go through, it's not just looking at what those comments are. Those actually play on, they're a play on words. So you can do something like pair share, you can do the clock where you have partners and you go, 
I'm a two o'clock, you're a two o'clock. So instead of them sitting there and go, go find a friend to talk to or go do this, they go, go find your two o'clock. And so they get up and they go find their two o'clock. And the teacher just, it, they give them actually at the beginning of the year, they get a, a time of what time belongs to each child so that they don't spend that wasted time in actually doing instruction time. The next one is the thinking process, which is the thinking maps that I talked about a little bit before. Again, the administrators were able to go through the training. Alexis Cruz Freeman, the principal over at Pima, did a very quick training with the principals before they actually walked into. It was, she's a trainer of trainers, and we were able to pull her in and say, can you introduce what thinking maps are to the principals who might not have known exactly what they are? So she did a training, a very quick one for them, and then we were able to offer through Cheryl Redner's department through teaching and learning, she actually set up two trainings for the principals where we were able to go through, how do you use this as an administrator? There's one thing using it in the classroom, but how do you demonstrate it and know that it's your expectation of yourself and that's what you're gonna to expect to use. So if you're using it, then your teachers are gonna use it and then the kids are gonna start using it. So they went through that first part and that was all on administrative, how you use it as an administrator. This last Saturday was the very first day that the teachers and the principals, they had a choice, they have four different trainings they can go to and they're starting to get introduced to it and David will get to talk about that because he has a very exciting comment to make about and I don't want to steal his thunder. So the next one is family engagement. And Karen Maps is a professor at Harvard and she pretty much is the one who has done a lot of the research on this and she brought Ron Muir in and Karen actually was originally the one who was going to do the presentation nationally. And she says, I'm not the right person. I'm not out in the schools. I'm not the one seeing what the teachers are doing and what the principals are. So she pulled Ron Muir into it, who was a professor with her at Harvard, and asked him to start going around because he had just left the school area. And so when you look at the definition of family engagement, I'm going to read it to you if you don't mind. Family engagement is any way that a child's adult caretaker, biological parents, foster parents, <coughs> siblings, grandparents, etc., effectively support learning and healthy development at home, at school, and in the community. So what basically that saying is, the family is no longer mom and dad. The family is an extension, and so we need to bring everybody in, and no more just have them as a, a room mom or somebody who makes copy for, copies for us at school or helps out with cupcakes and we need cupcakes. These are actually times now where we bring parents in and say, we would like to show you how to teach your child how to read. We would like to give you those skills. We would like to show you how to do math with your child. If you're a fourth grade parent, and you haven't done math yourself at the fourth grade level for a while, and most of us say, well, that's not the way I learned how to do it. This way, our teachers are bringing and inviting the parents into their schools so they can start training parents how to go back and use this in their classroom or at, at home. So when kids go home and say, do you have homework, the parent can say, I can help you with the homework, and that's what our goal is off of family engagement, not just the parents, but the grandparents, if it's a sibling, if it's a foster parent, we need to get everybody involved in supporting that child so that child will be successful. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Paninsky. Thank you. Governing Board members, President Beckman, Dr. Picard, Sandra, and guests, again, and community. On behalf of our Coronado principal team, Mr. Rentala from Hohokam, Mrs. Cruz Freeman, Ms. Palatucci, and Mr. Ardone, I'm happy to give a quick update on our professional development rollout um, that has taken place in our complex. As Mrs. Ybarra stated, in order to see our students ultimately succeed at Coronado High School and beyond, it is our commitment that we are sending Coronado High School the very best version of each child coming through our elementary and K-8 schools. This begins not only with the alignment within our Coronado principal team, but with our teachers and all of our students having skills they need to be successful as they progress through Yavapai, Pima, Hohokam, and Tonalia K-8 and becoming future Coronado High School Dons. 
This past fall, our principal team went through the same training as our teachers on the Marzano 9 strategies prior to our teacher rollout. The Marzano research, this body of research, has truly stood the test of time and provides strategies for our teachers to yield higher results with our students. Following the principal refresher, every K-5 teacher in our complex, to which there's 65, I think, um, teachers total in our Coronado Complex Elementary, underwent um, a review of all these strategies and began classroom implementation late last fall. As Mrs. Yabara shared, teachers will continue to receive professional development this semester. Um, in fact, tomorrow with our third through fifth grade uh, teachers are gonna continue with their Marzano research and professional development journey with Mr. Williamson. Following our first round of professional development in the fall, we asked our teachers, list a strategy you learned today that you can immediately implement with our students. Teachers stated um, via survey that graphic organizers to include thinking maps, clock partners, as Mrs. Ybarra shared, using I can statements to establish learning targets, and cooperative learning strategies were listed all as positive benefits to our Coronado children. In addition to the Marzano, secondly, we are excited to continue our campus-wide rollouts with thinking maps this spring. Following our, following our principal team training, our teachers began their journey this past Saturday and started their first round of training with thinking maps. The presenter, Mrs. Carino, with the thinking maps organization was fantastic. Um, this week and, we, and really helped create a common understanding and common language amongst all of our teachers and administrators within the complex. Further, as a principal team, we established a K rollout plan whereby we roll out each map to our students this spring. Many, to, many teams who attended uh, this past Saturday were very enthused um, about uh, this initiative and asked if they could start immediately, to which my answer was, Absolutely. Um, our main takeaway from the professional development was that our students are better able to understand what they are learning by organizing their thinking via the maps. This is a valuable tool that helps our students organize their thinking and ultimately will yield higher achievement for our kids within the complex. Recently, our principal team visited a school that had been using this strategy for over a decade. When we entered a fourth grade math class, we observed students being able to deduce from the word problem which type of thinking was required and choose the appropriate map to organize their thinking and ultimately find the answer. The maps again serve as a universal thinking process for our students that help them in any grade, any subject or content area, kindergarten through eighth grade. In schools or complexes that have utilized these thinking processes it becomes an embedded part of the learning culture, of the teaching culture, that ultimately yields better results for our students. We are excited to take this journey as a complex this spring and watch our students soar with these strategies into the 1920 school year. Oh, sorry there. Finally, we cannot forget the undeniable influence the family has on the child as the child's first teacher. A renewed focus this year on family engagement has been critical to the success of our schools. Last fall, we had the chance to learn from two speakers, Dr. Steve Costantino and Ron Muir, on family engagement. Both were beneficial to understanding the critical role of the parent as partner and learning ways to increase partnership, this partnership, and ultimately student achievement. Outcomes in our schools to date include changing the culture of how we view family engagement and what our family engagement events look like at each of our sites. We know that the key ingredients to engaging our parents are first and foremost, there better be food at the event, and second, we make it fun for our kids. But the work of Ron Murr also taught us step three, which is to build fun, engaging events, which also help parents be better parents, giving them ways to help their children learn at home. By way of example, we recently had our family game night where we had two intermissions during the event. During the intermission, we had all of our students who were in the cafeteria head into the Tiger's Den to do uh, fun minute to win it games with our teachers 
whilst our parents stayed in the cafeteria. This was a great time uh, for our family engagement team uh, to have a quick window to give top 10 tips on reading and math strategies that parents can implement at home. We had parents interacting with each other, sharing best practice of how they work with their students on reading and math. Super quick, super impactful, and working as two partners to take our kids to the next level. We also had free food. <laughs> to conclude, we believe that Marzano 9, Thinking Maps and Family Engagement will take our students to the next level. Our K-5 and our K-8 teams are fully committed to sending the very best to Coronado High School as future dons. I do want to take a second to thank our district curriculum team, our coaches, district coaches, central office leadership for your continued support within our complex. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Hagigat to talk about measurements of effectiveness with these three strategies. Thank you, Dr. Perninsky. Appreciate that. Um, wanted to share with you, this is what he went through with the Marsano 9 thinking processes and family engagement. Uh, as we continue this work, we want to make sure that there's a way to monitor and have measurements of effectiveness. We know that we're at the early stages of unifying the entire learning community, but we want to make sure that we do not leave out these measurements of effectiveness. When you look at something, you want to make sure that you monitor by being able to observe what it is that is being applied and implemented in the classroom. We are very committed and interested in having meetings, ongoing meetings, to see what it is that we need to refine or what it is that is really working well so that we can celebrate those members within that community. We want to have benchmark data uh, that includes what we already have within our district, which is within the ELA and the math. We'd like to look at graduation rates, increased student engagement, and family engagement all of these areas, we are very interested in developing something that is going to be right for the community. These are our next steps as we continue to prepare our administrators and our teachers and the journey that we know is going to be able to improve academic achievement for our students because we are selecting practices that are evidence-based and that have worked in other places, including some of the schools that have been led by members of our team. So with that, I open it up for questions, if you have any questions for either myself, Mrs. Zibara, or Dr. Praninsky. Thank you very much for the time that you've given us, and thank you to the Coronado Learning Community team for their effort, flexibility, and understanding, and knowing that we have a journey and a path that we need to pave for all of our students. Do I have any questions? Board Member Greenberg. Hi, uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the measurements and effectiveness, and I apologize for not submitting these questions to you earlier, um, how exactly, I don't know if it's in the works, if you guys are still debating it, but how exactly at this point in time do you think you might measure increase in family engagement or increase in student engagement? Is there uh, is it just observational that, or anecdotal that teachers report greater engagement by by um, students, or that parents are emailing them and saying, "Hey, you know, I want to help my student with this. How do I do that?" Is that we what are, you're looking for? We are looking at both quantitative and qualitative, and we haven't decided exactly what it is that we will be focusing on. But when we do, it's important part of this is through attendance. We want to make sure that we collect that uh, the attendance numbers of families that are coming and visiting our schools, but we also want to be very careful as part of our definition that we showed you earlier, it says that home involvement is extremely key. Not all parents can come to our schools, but there needs to be ways for us to measure the support that is coming from the home. Um, we're still developing those pieces. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we select the right evidence, but we also don't want to just jump into quickly measuring something without really looking at what are the best ways of measuring. So we're looking at, uh, for thinking maps, for example, um, I was one of the schools that 
was able to implement that and it led us to a really good outcome and so part of that was observational and you as an administrator really owning what it is that's being implemented uh, you could see it all across the school when you walked in and when you had conversations with your students they were explaining those processes to you without even noticing that they were all referring to one of the tools that were given to them based on these thinking maps. So a lot of it is observational, but it also needs to be strategic through our walkthroughs. And as a learning community, we are planning to continue to support one another through the walkthroughs and really see what is the percentage of teachers that are implementing these practices with fidelity. We need to provide the needed support and the needed ongoing training so that they can be confident about the strategies that they're implementing on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any further questions or comments? Okay. Board Member Beckham? <coughs> I can't get my request off. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm just going to follow up also with the measurement and effectiveness. So if, and, and I heard you say it was in the development stage, when do you think that you might be uh, finishing up we're hoping to be able to do it metrics. towards the end of this year because we really want to get all of the professional development and have an idea as we walk into the 2019-2020 school year so that we are able to really uh, support this implementation. So we're hoping to be able to do it towards the end of the year so that we're prepared for this following academic year. We have continuous meetings as we continue to really provide the support that we need to be successful in this initiative. And, and I think we recognize that, that that it's an ongoing process, especially when you have observation involved. And I really appreciated that part of um, understanding the presentation of, of having the monthly ongoing meetings so that you're getting immediate feedback. And if there's anything that you can change, that you can do it quickly. Um, but if you could also, I'd, I'd ask that you follow up with us. And Absolutely. at the end of that period, if you'll provide us with maybe the the, the, the plan and your measurements of effectiveness and then some of your results, knowing it is the first year, but then that we can uh, know that information going forward, that that'd be fantastic and yes. good luck with it. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, do I have any further questions or comments about the update on the Coronado Learning Success Initiative Plan? Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, moving on to agenda item 6B, first review of the 2019-2020 capital outlay budget. And I will introduce uh, Mr. Gad, our chief financial officer. Thank you, Dr. Cricard, uh, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, we will attempt to get some PowerPoints up here for you so that... Um, <laughs> okay. Sorry. The uh, the purpose of uh, this review, along with the M and O budget, is to get the board familiar with the proposals that we will finally be making to the board for your approval officially in June and July when the legal adopted budget is due to the state for next year. The capital outlay budget is, uh, is important um, and we've tried to summarize for you and you just got handed a summary that's a whole lot better to read than this one and I apologize for the size of the print. And the funds that we are going to discuss this evening are across the top of the page. Each of those is a separate fund with duh, capital outlay, override, adjacent ways, bond, and school plant. The annual capital budget that the district receives each year automatically is duh, the first column. The rest of the columns require an election or board action in which to create those allocations. The capital override, of course, requires a vote every seven years, and the amount that we receive from that override is $8.5 million a year. You can multiply that by seven and get that into the high $50 million range when you consider all seven years of funding. 
Adjacent ways requires the board, when you adopt the budget, to include uh, an amount that would be added to the district levy for purposes of basically infrastructure and would be absolutely necessary, unless you intend to spend bond funds, necessary in which to deal with construction projects that are major, that are altering bus bays, roadways, et cetera. And the bond budget is uh, obviously requires an election. We currently have a bond of $229 million that we are implementing expenditures for. And then school plant, that is in the last column. It is a budget that collects uh, lease, long-term lease, and sale money of district facilities. And that uh, would have the, you know, recently the district sold its, uh, its previous district office and that fund, uh, that money is involved in there. I would tell you that the statute governs how you can spend school plant money and in our case it almost exclusively is for capital outlay. There are ways to move monies between these funds and ultimately affect m and but currently if you just took school plant and asked how does that money, if we spend it from the school plant fund, what does it need to be spent for, the answer is capital outlay. Uh, capital outlay. So in other, words, in other words, that school plant column that you see next to the very last. That represents sale money from district surplus facilities, and if if you're not into transferring funds, its its use is for capital outlay only because of the situation that we have. And I will just briefly tell you what it is: the dis the, the state will not allow you to exceed your M and O budget by more than 15 percent. So since we have a 15 percent override. That precludes us from using school plant funds for m and If you decided to do something less than 15%, then that fund could be in play for some purposes of operating funds, okay? Most districts do not do that because they're expecting that money to be used for capital in addition to the 15% for the override. But there is a relationship between the two. Um, so, I just wanted the board to, to know that it is a complex subject governed by three and four pages of statute. Uh, it gets difficult. Uh, if you, it depends too on the amount of debt that you have outstanding versus your assessed valuation. And, and that also works into the formula as to whether, what you can do with the uh, school plant fund. As you move down the, if you take the left side of this summary page, there is page number references down the left, and those page number references will take you back to the backup and give you a little more information about what that particular item is going to, is intended to be spent for. And by the purpose of this capital budget is because most of these funds can be used interchangeably. You can use DA for a phone system, you can use bond for a phone system, uh, you could even use capital override for a phone system so that these funds are somewhat interchangeable as long as they're capital in nature. You can almost do the same thing with, with, the, the, with a multiple, multiple number of funds. They also can work in conjunction with one another. You could split a phone system. Let's say the phone system's $3 million. You could spend a million out of DA for it, you could spend a million out of capital outlay override until eventually you get to $3 million. That is the purpose of doing the summary so that you can see all of the available capital funds in one place. And it's, it's hard to keep track of things other than trying to do it on basically a, uh, a, um, a flow chart as, as, as you see here, a spreadsheet. The, the format of this summary starts out with unallocated. That's, that's a dollar amount that we have not chosen to identify to spend on anything specifically. It is there should something come up that we didn't anticipate and we have money therefore that we could use that unallocated amount in which to cover whatever that expenditure is. Down at the bottom of the page, the total expenditures including the unallocated amount is listed for each of the funds and it totals $53 million, uh, 30 million of which is bond. 
each of the funds has a budget capacity number, and I should say each of the funds, the two first funds do, because they are formula-based. The budget capacity for DA relies upon your average daily membership times your 100th day ADM, and that yields, in the case of DA, $3.8 million. We also are able to take and bring forward any monies that we did not spend in the previous year. And so the carry forward from 1819 is uh, $2.8 million. So we really have $6.6 .6 in which to work with as far as the DA is concerned. If you move up a little bit to where it says carry forward 2021, that is an intended carry forward. That is an intended amount to be reserved to go into the following year. So, you know, so you get to understand the format. We're bringing in money from the prior year. We're expending money in the current year. We have some of it unallocated, and we also have some of it that maybe you would call unallocated, and, and it certainly is, but it's also intended for a purpose. The purpose is to start the following year and not, and not be at zero when you do it. It's for purposes of, uh, of just having a balance there that keeps the fund very solvent because these funds are dependent upon revenue sources that fluctuate. This particular one is contingent upon um, two uh, property tax payments one in November and one in April. So you have this carry forward amount that helps you from a cash flow standpoint if you plan for it. And, and this way, we uh, are almost assured that it will be there unless we decide to divert it during the year for some purpose. So it, it, it also it not only is, is, is depicted here as what we're going to spend the money on, it's a plan. The plan on what we want to do in subsequent years is a plan that's being dealt with through a carry forward a mandated carry for it. We've decided the mandate ourselves. If you choose to spend more than $6.6 .6 million, then basically, the, and the two million is a part of that, but then you would take the two million and would allocate it to specific things. And as you did that, then that carry forward would start declining for the following year. Okay, so I, and I know a lot of this is confusing, but it's, it's, trying to, it's trying to put everything together in one place that you can try to get some um, some perspective on all of the capital funds that the district is involved with. The attachments uh, to each of these subjects uh, are the first one is district technology. Uh, we are in a second year of a copier replacement plan for $300,000. And you can see the rest of the estimates as to replace copiers in the schools. And those are purchased machines because of age and technology. And then there's a district-wide technology amount to cover computer repair and other needs that might arise. So we have a bit of flexibility in here beyond copiers to deal with a, sp a fairly small amount of, of technology. As you move to the next one in the capital override, also in the classroom technology column, we have student computers. That's 1.1 million, so it's a fairly large investment. And we're headed toward a one-to-one -one ratio of devices to students. And that's, this will get us quite a bit of the ways there. And we have hardware that includes all kinds of different subjects. Um, and I, I know Debbie is here to help, help me with that, but you can see some of the examples here. We also are phasing in a new phone system that we began several years ago. So there's, there's a, a variety of things when it says hardware here as to what those components particularly are. District-wide software, it's a fairly large um, dollar amount. You can see some of the major expenditures would be the first is the finance system the district uses called Tyler. Uh, there's curriculum 195, Microsoft licensing for 186, some curriculum for 164, you can science, you can see the list here. But there's quite a bit of funding allocated to software purchase or software maintenance uh, amongst, these different, um, amongst these different programs. Bond renovation, um, Cherokee is included here and it includes it on the basis of spending a f the full amount assuming the feasibility study would indicate a rebuild. 
and that's the amount we've talked to the board before about uh, what price ranges rebuilds are in, <coughs> renovations or remodels are considerably less than this. The feasibility study and what the board's decision is in the end will affect how much ultimately we're going to spend on Cherokee. Uh, we have included in here, at this point at least, the full rebuild amount for purposes of planning. Adjacent ways, we brought out of the total $4 million for adjacent, excuse me, the $2.8 million for adjacent ways, we've separated out $500,000 and basically reserved it for Cherokee. We're assuming that when we get plans and all of those things done, there's going to be some impact on bus bays and fire lanes. And this is the budget that is eligible to pay for those so that we don't need to worry about taking up those projects out of the $20 million. Uh, maintenance plan. Right now, the maintenance plan is almost totally reliant upon bond funds. We have carved out of da $750,000 for maintenance. That is not going to be adequate if the bond funds were not there to assist in, district, in, in building maintenance. A good rule of thumb here is about a dollar a square foot per year. This district has four million square feet under roof. That's a $4 million budget, not a $750,000 budget. So obviously the bond is providing lots of help with um, that maintenance plan as the bond begins to expire. Hopefully the district will have been able through duh to increase the 750 so that it becomes the sole support if necessary of the district's maintenance plan. And as an aside, duh will get bigger every year for the next three years because the state is restoring the capital outlay money it took during the recession to balance the state's budget. And they're doing it at one fifth per year. That's about $3 million a year. So DA will grow, and as it grows, the district should be allocating a goodly portion of that growth to a plan that is underfunded currently and is relying almost totally on bond in which to, in which to fund its maintenance program. Playground equipment, uh, $350,000. You can see what the structures are. Uh, typically, the standard of, of what structures we have, especially for primary and playground equipment, are there. Rubberized surfacing uh, at multiple sites. Um, that's a part of this plan for safety purposes. Furniture and equipment. Um, it's both occurring in the capital outlay, uh, in the capital outlay override budget and in duh. It is using $40 a student. And you can see that basically the school and the staff would allocate, decide what they want to purchase with that amount of money. Um, and we do it on an ADM basis in terms of allocation that amount. When, and we do it on a projected out enrollment basis. So if enrollment at some schools comes in higher next year than what we had projected, then we will add money to those schools who have a higher enrollment. And we put in a little money aside as a part of the million dollars to do that. We are not planning to take away any money from somebody that we may have overestimated a bit. School transportation. Um, as, as most of the board members know, buses were a fairly significant portion of the bond. Um, there is uh, a projection of three 84 passenger buses to be purchased in 1920 for 460, special needs buses for 750, and then DA would come in with the white fleet replacement schedule, and you can see the vehicles there. The bond provided only for buses. It did not provide anything directly for White Fleet. So White Fleet now is a new item that's budgeted in the district's regular capital outlay budget uh, to try to do something with replacing old, worn out vehicles. The district's fleet is about 350 vehicles, as you saw from the inventory that was presented a couple of board meetings ago of which about 150 are white fleet vehicles. So there's quite a sizable number of white fleet vehicles in addition to buses that will be needed to deal with. And remember the standard that we talked about, it was 10 years, 100,000 miles is the standard we talked about with the white fleet, 20 years and 25,000, 250,000 miles was a standard that we dealt with for, for buses. Library and fine arts. Um, the um, 
The library budget as projected in uh, this document allocates $15 a student, it's allocated on ADM just as furniture and equipment is. And over time, I think we will, be, we will be looking at the size of the library collections at each school. There are some standards as to what the size of the collection needs to be based upon the number of students at the school. When we find that some schools may not have the number of books to meet that standard, then we intend to provide some money at the district level to help that school get closer to the standard in addition to the $15 as a replacement budget. Fine arts, there's an allocation for the schools and there's also one at the district level and it's kind of the same process where if a school uh, has a substandard number of instruments because of, of instruments that have worn out or whatever, we will try to put some of the district money directly at that school to help them catch up with the instrument inventory and give some money to the rest of the schools for purposes of replacement of instruments that are no longer serviceable. Curriculum, there is a math adoption, as you know, this year that we have allocated money to. Part of that adoption will be paid for next year. Uh, most of it this year, but some of it next year. We've set aside $500,000 to pay the part two amount. Um, there's also some instruction materials in the capital outlay override uh, budget. Uh, math workbooks and other one-time purchases are planned from there. And then DA has 100,000 for whatever needs may be identified during the year uh, for purposes of curriculum improvement or maintenance. Athletics. Um, it's going to be allocated at this point. The proposal is to allocate the money on a weighted student basis. That would mean that uh, in grades K 6 through 12, that would mean that high schools obviously would receive more money per student than middle schools be because of the extensiveness of their athletic program. You can see the things that we would be purchasing, which is pretty standard. Uh, so that's how we're intending to deal with that. Uh, at this point, we may decide to allocate some of that uh, to physical education, although remember the schools have $40 a student already for furniture and equipment. So the expectation here is if you're below grade six, that that money generally satisfy physical education. So this money is, is devoted to specifically to what you, most people would term to be an athletic program where there's competition. Okay, so that, uh, Madam President, members of the board, is a brief overview of the capital budget. Um, the second review will occur on February 7th. And then we will ask you in April, April 11th to be precise, for some tentative approval of this budget so that we can move ahead with purchasing things and have them here as best we can before school starts and issuing purchase orders earlier than July 1 for next year. And um, I think this is the first time the district has had the benefit of seeing all of it at one time. I mean, you know, I, I can't even carry around where that item is, you know, when you got five funds. Let's see, did we provide that for, and duh. No, no, that's, that's capital outlay override. You know, even I can't keep track of. So, it's important when you're doing large purchases and you're trying to use multiple sources of funds to make it all happen, that you do something like this and so the board can see in its entirety. This is all the capital money we have. And, and so you can help prioritize then the use of that money a whole lot better than you can if you were in isolation of just looking at the, and then I look at the override and then I look over here at bond. Uh, this is intended to do just the opposite uh, from that approach. So, Madam President, members of the board, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them for you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Gadd? Oh, yeah. Board Member Kravitz? Oh, get your that off. Um, okay, I have a lot of questions. But you have another presentation for us, don't you? Okay, so I'll save some of those, my questions for that. But um, you show the budget carry forward is $41,690,000, if I'm reading this correctly. And we had a discussion about, I think, carry forward several months ago, and 
and so that, that whole discussion about, well, is this money actually available? How much of it is available? Am I, am I thinking of this, is this the same money or this is a different it's funding? It's different. Money? We okay. were talking about the M&O budget when we okay. talked about carry forward previous. All right. This is capital. So this is all capital. So it's things and not people, it's things. And the carry forwards here can be whatever amount we want. What we've done is chosen an amount we thought was reasonable to be able to always have that beginning balance in the following year. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I tried to, I reviewed a whole bunch of things and I printed out a whole, a lot of previous presentations thinking, oh, I'm gonna get it this year. Um, this is a so really this is complex an, subject. This, Don't feel bad. That, so this you know. <laughs> this is not this does not include any of the insurance trust money or anything. No, okay. No, okay. I want to be no. clear on that. Does not okay. have anything to do with that subject. So, um, all right. And these are all. Then we the last time we looked at the budget, we talked about budget controlled accounts and cash accounts. This is not this. This is just all the capital that we've approved. That's right. Okay. Just that's checking. Right. Okay. I think that's it for now. Thank you. <laughs> Board Member Greenberg. Uh, Mr. Gadd, thank you for that presentation. Um, the first thing I wanted to point out is I had asked Mr. Gadd a couple questions before this meeting, uh, specifically just the general broad ones. You know, is this a healthy budget? What are we looking at in the future? Uh, he provided his opinion, and Mr. Gadd, please feel free to add on to it if, if I am. Uh, relaying it incorrectly, but um, he said that the line items that we have here are pretty typical of school districts of our size, given our geographic scope, our student population. Um, he further said, because I, I pointed out, you know, that breakdown of the technology and what we expect to spend was very helpful. Uh, he further stated that a lot of those areas, for example, software, are things that the district are being proactive on and trying to bring those together to help save money as well so that we're not having multiple softwares doing different things when we could have a single software package that might cover a couple of those areas. So I thought that was quite beneficial for people to know. Um, this proposed capital plan, in his professional opinion, is a, a conservative budget contingent um, that, that seems quite sustainable, especially in light of the fact that Da will increase given the, the recent legislation that passed under uh, Governor Ducey. So those were um, all, all positive things, I think, I'd like to share before we delve into any more questions. My, my only question, um, Mr. Gadd, for you is, uh, and again, this was a very helpful presentation, for the school plant fund, it looks like our intent is to expend that $6 million this in, in the budget in some way. It's just not allocated yet? We, we don't have any current plan to spend the $6 million in 1920. Okay. It, it, sits in the, it sits in the fund, it earns interest, but we have no plan in which to spend it. And, and it specifically, I will tell you that it may have ultimately some bearing on the M&O budget, but we want to try to save that fund for later on if something really significantly uh, comes up. You have to remember that this school plant fund does not replenish itself automatically as Dodd does. It is a one-time cash fund that's been created through the district depositing lease and sale revenue. So once we spend it, it's gone. And so we just thought that we just needed to hang on to that for a while at least to see how upcoming elections and everything else uh, will come out. Thank you. Board Member Beckham. Thank you so much for putting this in one place. We really do appreciate it. Um, can you go back to the slide that talks about curriculum? I can try. I'm not sure that you know, help. You can get back to them. Maybe you may have to. We need. Okay, thank you. There we go. Okay, so I just wanted to um, get some clarification because last year we approved a budget for the math adoption. And are, therefore, are we not using all the funds that we approved for that budget and then that's part of the carryover that is reflected here? <coughs> I'm 
going to ask Dr. Nance to respond to that, but we are using all of the funds. My understanding is for math adoption in the current year before June 30th, we will have spent the entire set aside for math. I believe that this is an added amount to cover the proposed adoption that will be in front of the board. Dr. Nance, can you help me a little bit with that? I, I will try. Um, board member, back up. The math adoption will be coming to you at, in February for your approval. Um, it will be approximately uh, just a little bit over $2 million for that math adoption. Mr. Gad has budgeted $2 million for that, and we have enough in the capital override to pay for the additional cost. Math, because it's a K-12, every student type of an adoption is a very expensive one. We knew that going into it. Um, but the team did a very good job of, of getting very close to the $2 million budget that we had anticipated. Um, I think what I'm, I'm referring to may, may be the summary. I thought last year we approved the math adoption for this, we, for, for this year, which would be the 18-19 year. What we did. Right, and that's what you're talking about. This we'll is talking about the upcoming year of 1920. So, that's why I get where we approve the two million, and that will be spent it for the eighteen nineteen year. So this additional two million here, that is for the nineteen twenty year. It's that that that's correct. So that if those those aren't the same. Okay. Yeah, so. I, I'm the, the two million to. that's on this particular is it, a, a very small portion will you be used for the math adoption that we are adopting right. in the 18-19 year. The additional funds, okay. which I will guess, let's just say a million eight, what will that be used for? Is that for the we, social studies adoption? Or yeah, we, we have a calendar um, which, again, is, is a flexible calendar that could be modified at any time. We presented that to you. Um, at the work study in September, and it really plots out the adoption plans for the next few years. The next adoption cycle on that schedule is world language. World language will not be as expensive as math because obviously not every student in the district, <coughs> including many of our elementary students, are in a world language class. So. Um, it will be a little bit less next year as we look at the world language, but that process has not started yet. We'll begin this spring. Okay. So the actual funds that is noticed here, the two million, a small portion of that two million will be used for the additional uh, math adoption, other than the two million that's going to be spent this year in, in this year's budget. And then the rest is going to be spent on social studies and oh, world language. possibly world language. World language. Is world next. language. And then does that two million include that eight hundred and thirty, which is the my math workbooks and other one time purchases? No, the, the eight hundred and thirty thousand dollars are for ongoing expenses oh, here, that, that we have on a regular basis. Then those are requests we get from schools. Those are ongoing purchases to cover um, items across all 29 of our schools in the district. That is not part of the adoption. Okay, and I, and I see that here, it's under override, so I apologize for that. Okay, all right, so I just want a clarification on what that two million was gonna be used for, because most of it's not gonna be math. All right, thank you very much. Board Member Perleberg. Thank you, I'm gonna take that off. Okay, I'll be real quick. Thank you, Mr. Gadd, for this presentation. It's um, never my favorite, but I, I enjoy hearing. Um, the school plant fund, going back to that, $6 million, does that include, um, from what I understand how you defined it, does that include the sale of the old um, district? So those dollars are already in there. We won't be seeing another big jump up. Is that correct? Okay. And those dollars, again, can only be used for... Uh, facilities, correct? For possibly outlet. repair yes. or something like that. But 
but it could purchase supplies, is that? It, it's used for capital outlay if you, um, if you just look at it as a fund definition. If you decided, for an example, that you wanted to ultimately deal with the M&O budget, you would have to transfer a part of DA, mm -hmm. which is transferable, and then move what's in DA, $6 million worth, from DA to the plant. Okay, so okay. It, it's that transfer that I talked about. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you can get where you want to go, but it does require then looking at one of these funds that's transferable, and that would be the only one that is transferable in here is that, is that first column. Okay. okay, all right, thank you. And just for I think I know this, but the DA is um, also ADM driven, is that yes. correct? Yes, so, yes. So any declines we see or increases that it, it affects that as well? That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Board Member Kravitz. Okay, I thought of some other questions. Was there a slide up there that showed the athletic equipment? Oh, I just want to look at that real quick. Yeah. It's, in, it's in the override. Okay, so there will be it, some mats, weights, fitness machine. Okay, so there are some. Is, is this, it's driven by w what other t teams or activities are, are requesting it. So there are some women's or girls' uh, athletics included in this? I, I'm sure there is, and it, that 250 comes about from the bullet points that were connected up with the capital outlay override. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So, so, I mean, we've just moved that money, you know, and listed it here as it, was, as it appeared in the capital override uh -huh. pamphlet, election okay. pamphlet, and 250 appeared for athletics, but I'm sure that, uh, Nathan, am I correct, Nathan? Uh, uh, we'll be allocating that money to whatever the need is. I, okay. I know, uh, I know okay, we will. that's fine. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And the uh, six million that's unallocated, that's sitting with the county treasurer? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, so that's yes, not in our funds. And yeah. it's earning interest, and the interest mm -hmm. would show up on this line item again in next Interest year. is applicable to all of right. these funds. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And... So you, I think you, I, I don't want to misquote you, but you said if we didn't go out for an m and then we could use unallocated school plant funds to cover I, I those costs? I said that you could consider. I wouldn't necessarily advise it. Right. But you but could it, consider okay. a transfer of some capital monies to m and and therefore using the school plant fund to continue the capital expenditures by now allocating a part of that $6 million to capital outlay. Okay. Th uh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I have a question for you and a request. The first one is, could you please revisit the bond maintenance plan on capital? Um, you have 3.22 allocated for other projects. Please define what that, what would be, that would be used for, in your opinion. Let's see, you're back on maintenance? Yeah. There? Right there. Other projects on yeah. maintenance. Uh, other projects. Dennis, are you here? Would you yep. like to yes, he's over comment here. a little bit on that subject? She's asking about the bottom $3 million. Yes. Good evening, uh, President Beckman, members of the board, Dr. Krikard. Um <clears throat> The 3.22, each year I bring a new batch of uh, projects from our life cycle, safety and security, um, and school environment listing that was in the bond pamphlet. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're still working on the current year projects and haven't yet brought forward uh, the new projects for you to review and approve to go forward. So those include things like <clears throat> uh, exterior paint jobs, um, parking lots, um, classroom door hardware, um, roof projects. There's a number of, of projects and we can certainly revisit and I think Dr. Kukard, we're coming back on the seventh with some very specific information right. for we're, you. We're going to have a bond update 
uh, by Dennis and uh, showing off his new software program uh, at, at the work study, at the study session on the 7th. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Would, would front office, uh, the renovations for security, also be part of that 3.22? Yep. We're actually going to start getting ready for those here in the next couple of weeks. Yep. And that's, um, that's about a million nine for those uh, that we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you. And then one comment, you know, as you, we talked about this yesterday, as you budget money based on ADM for things like furniture and equipment, that, that might be the most appropriate way to do it. Um, but I had requested that as we move forward, that we have a discussion when we determine whether ADM is the most appropriate means as we keep equity in mind among our various schools regarding things like, you know, um, when we look at libraries and the fine arts, et cetera. And thank you. And we certainly understand that uh, yep. that equity issue. Okay. Uh, that's, actually, that's actually why we don't budget all of the money. There is a contingency for those for those considerations. Okay. Board Member Kravitz. Do we have any other questions on the capital? <laughs> okay. Moving on to C, project maintenance and operations budget. That's not the one. says on the front 1920 M&O budget review number two, Debbie. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, uh, Madam President, members of the board, this is the second review of next year's M&O budget. Remember the distinction now, we're moving from projects and furniture and computers and things, we're moving to a people-related budget at this point. 90% or close to that number is salaries and benefits that are contained within this budget. It's the largest budget that the district has. We reviewed it previously a couple of weeks ago. We're back with the second review uh, this evening. We will have a third review on February 7th. And we will be asking you on March the 7th for a tentative approval of this budget, and the reason for that being as early as it is, is for you to give us some authorization <coughs> to prepare contracts for issuance on March 19th, so that we can begin the employment process, especially for teachers, as early as possible. So with that, uh, the first slide, this is a formula-based budget in its entirety. Uh, it relies upon two major factors. One is your ADM count from the current year. It is not a backward-looking ADM. It is a current year ADM. So it is an estimate of what we think next year's 100th day ADM will become. And it's based upon a base support level, which you see up there as, as $4,000 and we're projecting that it will be added, uh, it will have an addition of $106 uh, dollars for purposes of funding a 5% salary increase from the state. So it's important to know that the way the state is doing this is it's not doing it as a supplement to your calculation. It's, it's basically permanent, permanently putting it into the formula because it's increasing the base support level. So it's not something that hangs out separately where you can decide that you want to take it away. It becomes very inherent in the formula, which is good, uh, which is the way that they are doing it. So uh, that uh, estimate after we apply some inflation of 1.8%, and the prediction now is around 2%, but it's not official yet, so we thought we would just stay with the 1.8, which is the inflation we had this year. Uh, that will bring the base support level up to 41.88 per student. We then uh, multiply that by the total weighted count, which is the, the first item up on the top of the 28,393. When you see the word weighted, it means that students have, are worth more than 1.0. They're weighted primarily to compensate for additional cost. 
lots of special education, uh, for an example. So that grows our 21, 22,000 students up to 28, and, and that is the number that we will use, and we're predicting the base ADM, the regular ed ADM portion, with the same decline as we had from last year to this year, about 569. So this projection is based upon repeating as a worst case condition, the same decline as we had from last year to this year. Because you remember that the estimate this year was in the 3, 350 range. It actually turned out to be 569. So we're, we picked up on that trend, I guess, and looked at it as a worst case condition. We just repeat that higher level of decline that we had from last year to this year, and that's what we've done in this projection. We have a teacher experience index, which is holding up okay, but remember, it's to compensate the district for high paid teachers. And that will be going down as, as, as retirements occur. So that is a factor that, because of our demographics, will become less and less each year. Once we apply the teacher experience index, you get a result of 121, 121 million. We apply the audit fee from a couple years ago at 54,000 and transportation at 8.1 million, and that is also a formula that's based upon miles and an amount per mile, just as you would with a taxi cab. And we wind up with a revenue control limit of 129 million. There is a 15% override, and as you know, it is the last year, next year will be the last year at the full 15, uh, of $19.4 million, and when we include that amount, uh, along with tuition income that we expect to get, those that's primarily special education, and a desegregation budget of 7.1, and a budget balance carry forward that we've talked to the board about previously. We're targeting 6% at this point, which would amount to 9.6 million. Dropout prevention, water savings, Prop 123, the total amount that the state will permit us to spend next year uh, called the general budget limit for purposes of our operating budget is $163 million. We then compare that to the amount that we had this year, $160.9 million, and we actually achieve almost a $3 million gain in our operating budget, but remember that's almost entirely the 5% salary increase for teachers. And if you look at the footnote, uh, of the amount that we're ultimately going to talk to you about for 5% for all staff, 1.3 million of it, is for teacher increases to raise our, to raise enough money in the budget to offer a 5% for teachers. The state is using an average teacher salary to compute the 5%. Ours is above the average. And the definition of teacher, uh, they are using a very narrow definition, must be in the classroom or you don't count. We are using a broader definition of certified staff, uh, librarians, counselors, et cetera, and as that occurs then that there's more eligibility of people to get the 5%. So those two items together, uh, basically the cost to the district is 1.3 of local money and the balance is uh, the balance of state. We have some estimated increases which appear on the next slide that we think are relatively <coughs> unavoidable. State retirement is going up three-tenths of a percentage point, and it's going to be fairly large next year. It's 12.1%. That has been now acted upon by the State Retirement Board, and then the district will match the 12.1, so the total <coughs> effort for retirement will now be 24.2. It is a fairly large contribution amount. Um, the minimum wage will take effect. Uh, going from $11 to $12, that's about $148,000. we have set aside some money to deal with additional programs that we might want to decide to offer next year, uh, $300,000. There is an increase automatically in the custodial services contract. Um, there, is an, uh, there is an increase in SROs uh, from uh, the city, and, and we've decided to establish and recommend strongly to you that we set, uh, we establish a self-contained special education stipend to attract special education self-contained teachers. Now remember, when we say self-contained, that is a smaller number than, a much smaller number than the resource special education teachers. These teachers would work with the more severe handicapped students. 
but we have a, a really terrible time, Dr. Nance can report on that, of finding and retaining um, special education staff. And most districts do offer a stipend. In this case, we're estimating $2,000 per self-contained teacher. Mm -hmm. And if we award that to our current teachers plus those that we're going to hire, we've got about 80 teachers here that would receive then that stipend amount. So that is the list that we've, we've been able to come up with at this point for increases. And if we decide that all of those are legitimate, then that million one will subtract from the positive position we had from the GBL of 2.9, and we would have a 1.8 million left. 1.8 million, if we would compare that number to where we would like to go, we'd like to recommend to you a 5% increase for all staff, so that not only teachers get most of that money from the state, but all of the support staff, all of the administrative staff get a comparable salary increase. That uh, number is 6.3 million. So between the 1.8 available and the 6.3, uh, the 1.8 available from the formula and uh, that compared to the 6.3 needed for salaries, we're deficit 4.5 million. So we've gone from positive to negative and we're going to recommend to you that we try to correct that by doing some budget uh, restructuring, some reductions. Um, this is the list that we've come up with so far. <coughs> Half a million dollars for administrative reductions. We don't know the specifics of all of that yet, but we will be sharing what we do know uh, fairly soon with you. Certified teaching staff reductions, that is primarily due to declining enrollment. And that represents 30 teachers less in the district for next year than we have currently. That coincides with the almost 600 decline that, we've, uh, that we're repeating in terms of the total student population. And some of that, of course, is coming from this year as a carrier, because we, you know, we didn't reduce any teachers this year, even though, even though we had a, a decline that was higher than predicted. So some of that is, is an enjoyment of lower class sizes this year because of ratios. But that amount plus what we expect, not to students that are not going to be here next year, if we repeat that decline again, to e yield roughly approximately 30 teachers, that's $1.6 million. The good news is we have no intention and have staffed, as Dr. Bowman will tell you, we have staffed on the current ratios, class size ratios. We have not increased the number of students on a calculated basis for any program, any grade level. We've done it simply through having less students to put into the formula than we had previously. Um, M&O positions, uh, there are cash accounts. Um, as Mrs. Kratz uh, talked about, those cash accounts were part of your, finan your monthly financial report. They're on page two. And they are not formula based. They are based upon how much money we take in and how much money we spend. There are some large balances in some of those funds, and I've mentioned that, I think, to the board previously. And we expect to get savings from those cash control funds. You can see the, the, the amounts up here. Of the $2 million, we would expect 800000 to come from indirect cost, 500000 from MIPS, 100000 from Civic Center, which are rentals of facilities, and 600000 from community education. Total then, if you added all three of those items together is 4.1. You compare that to the 4.5 deficit. We still need to find 395,000, but I'm comfortable with the inflation factor being a little bit less than I think will come in actually. The 1.8 I think will come in at two. And uh, I, I, I just think that we will be in a position, I think we'll be okay with the list we have here of producing a balanced budget for your approval that will ultimately go to the state and the county um, shortly, in July. To review those cash accounts, these are, these are kind of a, the way we got there. Their beginning balances for each of those are shown this last July 1st. They total $23 million. We expect revenue of 10. We have expenses projected at seven and a half. We have ending balances that actually will grow. 
if we don't do anything with those funds by approximately $3 million from 23 to 26. We're not in the business of every morning counting money. We need to start using some of this for a productive purpose of supporting the district's educational programs. And that's why we felt a $2 million reduction here with a $3 million growth, not something we should be concerned with in terms of not having sufficient funds to run any of these programs. They will be more than sufficient. As a matter of fact, should th still grow by about a million dollars. But this is a start into taking funds that have unusually high surpluses. They continue to have a lot more revenue than expenditures and using those funds in which to maintain our, our programs in the district. And I think that's a very appropriate <coughs> use of, and we're fortunate to be in this position of having these funds. So that, um, and then the highlights. Well, what we just covered. We have no budget reductions uh, that will negatively affect instructional programs, zero. We have no budget reductions that will affect class size ratios, zero. We are providing a 5% increase for all employees. That's food service, everybody. Um, we have no reduction in benefits. A matter of fact, we will be coming to you probably with a recommendation from the, in the, from the Employee Insurance Committee that actually improves some of our benefits a bit. Um, the 1.8% inflation factor, which we're now very comfortable, we're probably underneath where it will finally come in at. Um, we assume no change in the teacher experience index. The same reduction will repeat, 569. And we assume that the legislature will not do any harm to us in this current session. Big assumption sometimes, but we won't, they won't do any harm to us in terms of the formula, changing the formula, if anything, uh, the, I know special education is on their agenda to look at. Maybe they'll even enhance the formula. The weights will increase in some programs that will have a little bit more money. So, uh, you know, we're very pleased that we're able to present to you a balanced budget that I, I think is, it does not have any reductions in it. No personnel, no positions are being reduced. Um, other than the teaching positions that we will not need because of the reduced enrollment and we can provide a reasonable salary increase for, for everyone. So that, Madam President, is the presentation, and any questions you might have, I'll try to answer. Dr. Cricard would like to say something. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Gadd. I think it's uh, important not mention in here that we, what we have been talking about uh, with our various employee groups, too, is that with the, the this teacher, pupil ratio remaining the same that we have staffed schools on for the past few years so we're not changing that there will be a reduction in as be a reduction in number of teachers because we have a reduction in number of students so you lose 500 students you continue to staff the school at the ratio but closer to the ratio than where we are this year because we had 500 students less. That will cre that'll create some, some losses of staff, but not changing the published ratio. At the same time, we are taking a hard look at uh, the district office. Uh, Mr. Gadd and I are meeting with each one of the assistant superintendents in the next two weeks so that there are also uh, changes in the staffing of the district office. It's we are all in this together, and we will and we will look at efficiencies at both the district office as well as at the schools. Board Member Greenberg. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Gadd. Long time no see. <laughs> um, again, I asked the same questions as I did with the capital override. And his view was, again, the same, that it is a healthy uh, projected budget for the following year. Um, the two red flags, of course, are declining enrollment. And that is something that our district is focused on, especially with the continued CPI plans, as well as the four schools that are really focusing on that, building their community, building their culture, uh, and attracting more people. I think uh, Navajo, for example, this last weekend had a wonderful event 
canvassing neighborhoods and really bringing back the community, telling people, look, you know, this is a school that's coming back. And that was a wonderful event that Patty uh, and I attended, and I believe some of the other board members as well. Um, we also have the MO override that we should probably begin to discuss because in that first year, I believe we lose about $6 million. Is that correct? Nine. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> six or nine, six to nine million dollars, apologies, um, as that declines. And that is a significant amount because it does affect um, our arts programs, our extracurriculars. It affects everything that's currently funded by that MO override. Um, one point I did really want to highlight, which I do think is important, is the stipends for special education teachers re retaining that for self-contained teachers as well as others. We have, uh, I think, a lot of work to do in our special education department. I believe our district is committed to working on that and properly funding it to attract qualified candidates to work with our students. Our job at the end of the day is to ensure that we treat and care for our students as much as their parents do, uh, if not more. So uh, I just wanted to thank you for that presentation. Again, very well laid out and want to raise those points to my fellow board members. Thank you. Any further questions? Board Member Kravitz? I'm trying to turn off my request button. It won't let me, sorry. OK, I have a basic question. So now that we're into year, is it year two of current year funding from the state, mm -hmm. how does it affect our district if we um, under or overestimate our students? So it's a good question. If we have overestimated the number of students, we will have to come to you next year in 1920 and ask you to reduce the 1920 budget. In other words, instead of the decline being 569, the decline it turns out to be 700 or some such number. So the state asks the state for the money to follow. Your current year okay. budget and, and vice versa. If it's not 569 but only 300, then they would increase our budget for next year. Oh, they will. So, okay, so we don't lose. Originally, I had been told if we underestimate, and then we lose out, and you know. No, no. Okay. No. Um, hold on a moment. It's probably better to overestimate the decline than underestimate it because then you're trying to make a lot of changes mid-year that are not pleasant to make. Okay. In the cash accounts, what does MIPS stand for? It stands, oh, it's been a while. Medicaid. Medical. Yeah. Is that the Medicaid yeah. reimbursement? It, it is. Oh, Medicaid okay. Say no more. Yeah. Okay. Medicaid reimbursement. I can't remember the exact acronym, but okay. it is the Medicaid reimbursement. Reimbursement. Okay. Because I'm trying to match up this with what we did, I think it was back in October, with this. And on this, we had, uh, uh, under other district funds, there was self-insurance money. Is the self-insurance money part of this? No. So this is 26 million more. Yes. Okay. The self-insurance money we intend to review with the board with the new approach that we put in place for the trust fund in March so okay. that you have a full understanding of what that whole subject is. But no trust monies are in this report. Okay, so there's not, so it, it seems like there's a lot of, un I, I, I'm just, speaking off the top of my head, which is dangerous. It seems like there's a lot of unallocated money here. And I'm trying to understand what we have that's unallocated. And, and, and I'm trying to wrap my head around, we're mm -hmm. waiting, as you know, for a financial policy to like put some guardrails. How much should we mm -hmm. keep in reserve? That's coming. When can we expect that? Um, <coughs> Because there are going to be questions like, why, why aren't we allocating these, yeah. these funds? I mean, I, I think you see an example yeah. of that up here No, I know screen. you reduc reduced it. Those like balances million. have collected over some years. Yeah. The district is Oh, no, it didn't you know, happen just yesterday. Yeah, this is the over district has many not been years aggressive, where we've had to cut. It has not been aggressive cut. of managing right. those funds for the benefit of the entire district, especially what we've just talked about with the $2 million. Okay. And they've just grown and grown, and and not they've been isolated for some reason from this overall <coughs> discussion. Uh, the trust fund is no different. That one has built up some balances that have never been, to my knowledge, included in the overall picture of how do we provide employee benefits for for staff, and what do we need to have as a reasonable reserve, and what do we need to spend. That all is coming to you in March, but you won't see any increase up here for employee benefits, 
uh, medical insurance especially, because you know we will show you a trust fund budget that we believe is more than adequate to handle whatever percentage of reasonable increase we get from Kairos, who is our current carrier, right. and those kinds of things. And frankly, I, I'm going to be recommending to you that you rely on the trust fund for quite some time to be able to provide the current benefits plus improved benefits for employees. That uses, again, funds that have not been put into play, mm -hmm. uh, just as you see up here. And it's unfortunate because the district has probably made some decisions and done some things that could have been better. Not and made, we known did. That yeah. Those other funds were there in which they could be used. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, again, sort of like these cash accounts that we discussed, these are, again, are these held with the county or the the, the in the cash accounts and all the, these that are on this page. These funds are in addition to the projected M and O carryover that we saw in the formula. Okay. These, sorry, these funds that you see here are cash control funds. They're not budget control funds, so okay. they rely on revenue. Um, and it, it shouldn't be confused with the amount that we put on the first page on the formula where we had the M&O carry forward. Okay. That is coming directly from m and It's coming from a budget control fund <coughs> to ADM. So uh, it, I know this whole process is a little... <laughs> so budget, confusing. again, to review, budget controlled funds are funds that we can count on year after yes. year, cash yeah. controlled or maybe not so much, yeah. but we've still got, okay, exactly. we've got some, exactly. okay. Uh, da, 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 all right. And where, if somebody wanted to find, look, in the, um, where are the, the <laughs> cash funds listed in our budget? Is it only in our budget? How can we make sure okay. that there isn't a well, I'll call a black hole or just ignorance for no fault of anyone. That's a good question. You get a monthly financial report currently. It's a four-pager. Right. The front page is budget control. The second page is cash control. Third page is student activities. Fourth page is bond. If you look at that report, you go to page two. Right. Every single cash control fund that we have is listed, including the ones that you saw up on the screen. Okay. So you can look at those balances anytime you want to, draw judgments from that report because it shows you beginning balance. It, it shows you the same columns that we had up here. How much you started the fund with, well, how much revenue you took in, et cetera. So that's the way to monitor that the district has not got funds that it's not, it doesn't have a plan in which to spend, is to just to watch those monthly financial reports. Oh, okay. That's what they're there for. Oh, okay. Well, I think that, is that, correct me, um, Mrs. Perlberg, that's different. Yeah, that's, a, an that's a relatively new report. New report, okay. Has, so yeah, you know, yeah. that our previous governing boards weren't. I think you've only had that report three or four months now. Okay. Right? Yeah. All right. I just wanted to be clear on that. Thank you. Yep. Board Member Beckham. Um, I have a question on, and I, oops, I think it went back. It was on the MIPS, or the MIPS, the Medicaid Reimbursement Fund, mm -hmm. in which um, my understanding is, is that that fund has restrictions on the use of the funds. No. No, that one does no. not. No. It, you have to, it is a reimbursement fund, so it has paid for time that our nursing, our psychological staff has spent with eligible special education students. So all they're doing is paying back the district rather than paying uh, for professional services for those students outside the district for those services. So there, because it's reimbursement, because the district uh -huh. has already spent it out of its M&O budget, it is totally unrestricted in terms of how you use that reimbursement money. Oh, yeah. okay. So it's one of the few that has no, no restrictions, indirect cost, that also is up here on the screen, also has no restrictions either. All right, I'll talk to you so that I can understand that fully then. Um, well, then that does go to my next question. So I recognize that we have um, a projected, you know, uh, that we're in a declining enrollment that we projected to be very conservative um, and that we have the potential reduction of that six to nine million dollars in the capital override going away. So I, I understand that. But I'm looking also at, this is my third budget to approve. It was 17 originally, then 18, now this will be my third. And within that time, something that I notice that I keep on, I guess, just hoping and asking is, 
when are we going to be able to start maybe doing some new programs or providing additional instructional support or my big one on the counselors to reduce it from, even though I want it to be on the record, the state says it's one to nine, 900 or 950, and we are at, SUSD is at one to 450. I just happen to feel that it would be a great benefit to our students to reduce that further. What is it going to take for us to find those sustainable funds? Because I realize they have to be sustainable. It's not like one-time funds when you're hiring people and you can't just take it out of the school plant and use it for that. But at what point will we start discussing that we can be using some of these additional, these, this cash that we have for new programs or for instructional support like guidance counselors and also I have another little one I would like to add in there too um, that I think that would be helpful and it's in a relative to our budget isn't that much but we have four schools in which we have asked um, to come up with uh, improvement plans to help raise their enrollment but I know that we agreed at one point that we would not be providing them any financial support although I would like to have this board consider adding maybe some financial support to those four schools, um, and partly because I don't see it as a huge dollar amount. Um, and when, when will that happen? Can that happen, given the budget we have? And I, and I want to, again, I recognize the conservative nature, and I appreciate that because I happen to be conservative by nature myself. But I would like to have an answer when okay. we can. Can I just say something? Mm -hmm. Board Member Kravitz. Um, part, part of that, though, m maybe comes in with having a financial policy for our budget-controlled funds and our cash-controlled funds. So until we, we have a policy about how much should we, you know, be keep holding, e on. Be holding on to and how much is a, a conservative amount to spend, until we have a policy, I don't think we can, that it wouldn't be prudent to go forward with discussing what's on our wish list because I agree with you counselors mm -hmm. or or behavioral specialists or whatever those things are they're all important and I don't right. disagree with you I, I don't know that I don't know that they have to be separated I think the conversations can go hand in hand because we're not making any decisions by just having the conversation is it even feasible can we come up with those funds at the same time that we are looking at what that financial policy would be I would hate to have to wait for the actual policy to be having the conversation of if it's even possible to find funds, sustainable funds for those areas. But I totally agree. Yeah, with I mean, you I'm just concerned if we have the conversation, we're give, give, getting people's hopes up only to be That's dashed. A conversation. Can I? So, first of all, our obligation is to present a balanced budget. And that, that's what we're doing with this process now. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it would be instructional and an informational to have a study session uh, topic of those kinds of programs that the board would like to see and that we could then cost out and then we'd have a wish list and start looking at as if the if the uh, inflationary comes in at at 2.3 or 2.4 or something and all of a sudden we have a little more if our if the cuts that we have made due to um, enrollment decline uh, are greater than what we had expected, uh, produce more than what we have expected. And there are some other things that we're, we're looking at. We have been, I've had conversations with uh, Debbie Barra, who is this year halftime um, community ed director and what community education department uh, can do potentially and had done in this district before and other districts have done in terms of of uh, higher profits, more services to kids and parent and families, which then produces more revenue. So there, there are, uh, and a couple of others that Mr. Gadd and I have talked about. So there are, there are things that, that, that could show up in the future and it'd be nice to have that wish list that, that the board had. So um, I think that's something we can, we can look at this spring to look, have a, a session of talking about some of the programs, some of the enhancements that you'd like to see. 
thank you for, for that. I would, I would love to see that. Now, uh, I'll even tell you, you can roll your eyes at me when I ask for this last um, item, and that is um, when we speak of a balanced budget, I, and I don't know if you want to put the balanced budget up there, I, I envision that number being zero, and I think it's $395,000. Is there any way that we can move? Well, this is, this, is Jan this is January. Budget. Oh, okay. one of the, one of so the, it will be a zero at the time. What, that we have, okay. Yeah, okay. When, when we come forward with our budget in June, it will be it will it will be a balanced budget. Okay, yeah. okay. We it's keep talking end. about how it is, and I keep on going. You, you know, one of the one of the things, uh, unfortunately for our programs, but but fortunately for the budget, is that we have had trouble filling a lot of positions, and so. <laughs> that account, that, because they were budgeted positions, and so they're they're in our current budget. But we are saving money by not hiring people. Now we're not providing services that need to be done, and so that's that's the bad news. But uh, but that's just one example of during the course of a, the year, this budget is a live uh, organism, and it it. it ebbs and flows, it grows and it shrinks and it grows depending on various things that happen during the year. Madam President, if I could just add a couple of things. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that that m and budget balance carry forward is, is relatively high, I mean it, it's reasonable but it's on the higher side, is what Dr. Picard just said, we cannot fill open positions. That's what's driving upward <coughs> that budget balance carry forward. If you are in, a, in an economy and an environment where you could easily fill all of the open positions, I'll guarantee you that that budget balance carry forward is going to be a lot less. So the balancing here is when do things get better and how much, if I start allocating that money to other things, more counselors, whatever it happens to be, and then all of a sudden everything gets wonderful and we're able to fill all of those positions and now we're in trouble with the budget balance carry forward we're in trouble with maybe breaking even for that matter so you will find most districts now that have large budget balance carry forwards and that's most of us have all been caused by a single reason they have as much trouble filling positions as we have in filling positions there's positions that are open for months Okay, that all contributes to that budget balance carry forward. And it's not that we're not putting out the effort, because we are, it's just the, you know, the supply and demand subject. The second thing I would mention to you that might be helpful in your thinking is the enrollment decline we've just experienced took away the entire inflation factor. That enrollment decline dollar-wise took away the entire 1.8. If that doesn't moderate itself, the district is headed down the road for having no growth in its budget whatsoever, because it can't maintain enrollment and therefore can't use the inflation factor. So you can imagine when there is no money from the state for teacher salary increases, how large that deficit becomes. So one of the keys to this whole thing of providing enhanced services is can we get stabilized or at least stop that enrollment decline, which is going to be taking resources from us every single year that that continues. So you, you think of a budget, a district that actually has the same budget from one year to the next because inflation has been taken away by enrollment decline. How are you ever going to take, you know, those resources and expand the number of people that you can pay when the dollar amount doesn't become any larger? That's, you know, that, that's the other way to look at that subject. So those two things I would point out to you is the budget balance carry forward and why and then the inflation factor. And, uh, Okay, I have a quick question, a couple for you. Um, first, as you budget $160,000 for those hard to fill positions, such as, you know, experienced special education teachers, et cetera, you, um, I think it's fantastic, by the way, I'm in agreement with board member Greenberg that we need to focus on special education. You had mentioned that you are potentially taking, are you taking some of the MIPS money to offset the stipend for those special education teachers? No, I mean not directly, but I suppose we are because that's an added budget expenditure and the way we're balancing the budget is using MIPS money. So if you wanted to try to say that it doesn't have a direct relationship, it's, it's, it's just a budget balancing number, but it could if you wanted to say, okay, the, the, the special ed stipend is this much, we used MIPS, and that basically funded that you could also you could also do that 
if you wanted to try to segregate those pieces and what relates to which pieces, I suppose, I suppose you could. Special education is woefully underfunded in this state. Mm -hmm. And it's estimated that we, even with the weights, the state is only funding 40% of the cost. Okay? That means the rest of it is coming out of regular ed. That's why you have ratios that we do in the, those grade levels. They all are paying for special ed. Everybody knows that. And the special ed cost study that the state did some years back proved that. The issue is the legislature won't increase the special ed weights to equal the cost because that's too, too costly for them, I guess, because they'd have to raise taxes to do it. So this, this whole subject of special education has been this way for as long as I can remember, that it has never, ever been funded by the state in any kind of reasonable way at all. And are we considering offering a stipend for psychologists, too? No, in this particular case, the stipends are only related to self-contained special education teachers. Okay. Board Member Perleberg. Thank you. Um, okay, a lot of thoughts here. <laughs> flashbacks to a lot of years, unfortunately, because um, I, I mean, I think our conversations are, are right on track, both in the optimism and the caution. Absolutely, because um, trying to sort through here, I, I can't help as we talk about these cash reserves that we, of course, are all very grateful that are coming to the forefront and we're starting to understand and see. Um, I won't even attempt to understand in the past how they how they were back um, how they were uh, being held and growing um, as a board member who made the gut-wrenching decision to reduce specials uh, along with my fellow board members by half one year because we were literally told there was no other dollars to be found um, that's a hard pill to swallow so at the same time, happy these dollars are now having some light shed on them, but also feeling that caution of we know when bad times hit us, um, how our community reacts when it hurts our classrooms and it hurts our learning. No one wants that. It's, it's heart-wrenching. So um, to Board Member Beckham's point of in this board and in, in the past board has had a lot of conversations about how much do we need to hold on to and how much can we actually afford to let go now um, and accomplish so many of the things that we want to do. I, this board has to have that conversation as absolutely fast as possible. I'd also like to highlight in this conversation you said um, that the reduction in staff um, will be taken um, care of through attrition. I, I mean, so I, I'm kind of wondering where that balance of enrollment decline and reduction in staff but through attrition, um, where that ratio starts to get out of whack where you might actually be looking at a, a reduction in force in our staff. Is it? it, it we've got quite a ways to go. I mean, okay. We, we are typical, I think, of many districts. We're turning 20% of our teachers every year. I'm sorry, say that again. 20% of our teachers are gone every year. Okay. okay that's. That's okay. significant. I mean, that's 200 plus, as you probably know. Mm -hmm. if, and we're reducing 30. So it's going to take us an awfully long time. Okay. And hopefully never would hopefully we ever never. be in a position where we've got that kind of staff reduction <coughs> because of enrollment decline and we're, we're rivaling the, the, the whole attrition right. subject. The attrition subject is huge because of people leaving the profession or, or you know, right. getting something that pays more or whatever. Right. Kind of thing. It's more the opposite problem of, mm -hmm. of finding the staff that we need. Okay. All right. Well, I said, I, I too look forward to um, really wrapping arms around this, this budget along with our new world of current year funding and uh, enrollment concerns. So thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Board Member Greenberg. Uh, two very quick points. One, uh, I echo my fellow board members and our superintendent, uh, Dr. Creekard, that we should have a meeting to discuss that and set out those priorities. The only other thing that caught my attention, is this, is this based on a 1.8% inflation rate or a 2%? 1.8. Is it, is it my understanding that it, 
it'll it might likely be two percent though because it was 2.2 percent 2018 yes and if that <clears> occurs <throat> mr greenberg then that deficit that we had the three hundred thousand is basically it's gone. gone right that's what yeah. i was thinking thank you very much okay i have one further question since we're talking about these cash accounts and it's been asked of me a lot to differentiate the trust money as it relates to um the $40 million that we have in it or so, and why it can't just be dropped into m and in your opinion. The money was originally uh, put into the trust, I assume for insurance purposes, because that was the purpose of the trust. We have to remember that there are three types of insurances inside the trust. There's medical, there's workers' comp, and there's property casualty. So all three insurances are administered through, those, through that trust. It has, it has gotten itself into the position of growing balances, just as we've seen up here over the years. And um, it also is eligible for districts to prepay insurance. So if you had a large balance and you didn't want to lose it to the state in a budget control fund that had a limitation on how much you could carry forward, then you would be sending money to the trust. And back in, in not very many years ago, there was a 4% limitation on budget balance carry forward. So if you had six or eight or nine, you would be losing that budget capacity unless you had some vehicle in which to send it to it before the end of the year. The trust fund, because it's outside of the, the normal Arizona school finance scheme of things, was a place that prepaid insurance, and a lot of districts have done that, so that if they got into trouble, they could, they could pay employee benefits directly from the trust and have that balance sent back in m and So there's lots of reasons for it. Um, I think that it needs to be at a reasonable level, uh, and, and self-insurance, by the nature of it, has risk connected with it. The risk usually is that the claims before you can get to stop loss is 125% of what your claims were the prior year. That's a fairly, when we spend $15 million a year on medical insurance. So you've got six, seven million dollars that you would have to fund beyond the 15 million if claims got high. And so it, it, while, it, while 40 is a lot, and it is, it's too much, it needs to be more moderate than that. You have to be in a position of funding that $7 million in the year that you get 14 cancer cases and, and you know, all of those kinds of things descend upon you. So that it, the nature of self-insurance means that you have a reserve that you can bring into play whenever necessary because of claims that that would occur. So that, that along with retaining that fund for a contingency, in case something happens to the m and budget, I can then move employee benefits entirely into that fund and not have to ask you mid-year to cancel programs and everything else that might go with that. So it's operating not only as a basis in which to pay claims that are excessive, but it's operating as a place to go to if, if the roof fell in uh, and, and not disturb programs, students, families, all the rest of it. So, but do I think it's, the amount is too big. But I think you're going to need to maintain, when you look at all of those insurances, there's a $20 million annual premium between medical workers' comp and property casualty. You have to remember that those are all self-insured benefits and uh, what the consequences could be if you had some catastrophic claims to pay. That's the nature of self-insurance. It means, it means you are self-insured. You, you are the insurance carrier other than whatever stop-loss insurance you've purchased. So anyway, uh, a, a long subject, and I don't mean to dwell on it, but as we get into March, then we'll have some. You know, you need to maintain reserves so that you can meet whatever amount you need to have for stop-loss. You know, that 125% has to be in the bank. And if it's not in the bank, you run the risk then of not being able to pay claims, and that's not good. Board Member Greenberg. Sorry, the uh, lights don't turn off. <laughs> okay. Okay, do we have any further questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We're gonna move on with agenda item seven, public comments. Sandra, Sandra, do I have all the cards? Okay. I have to read this portion here. In conformance with open meeting laws, the governing board may not discuss or take action tonight on any matters raised during public comments that are not on the agenda. 
However the, however, the governing board may respond to direct criticism, ask staff to review the matter, or ask that it be placed on a future agenda. As a reminder, each speaker will have three minutes. Our screen will indicate the time with a 30-second warning from Vice President Beckham. Please be prepared to close your comments and relinquish the floor at the conclusion of your time. We do, not, we do ask that each speaker introduce themselves for clarity in the records, and we thank you for your time and attendance here tonight and your cooperation in following the medium pro meeting protocols. Okay, and our first speaker is Michael Norton. George Jackson had that role when I first spoke to the governing board, and I always enjoyed the smiles George would give me as I went over time, each time. I'm really happy and very proud that I get to be the first speaker this year to say, Governing Board President Mrs. Beckman, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I listened to Dr. Creekhart talk about the state of our school district today. And it triggered some thoughts, and I think that it, it, perhaps it's a good time for me to speak about the state of both the leadership of our district, as well as the state of the community and our attitudes. You know, there's no secrets that we went through some terrible times. I think back to the middle of 2017 and 2018, we had hundreds of people on Miller Road who weren't happy. We said some awful things about each other. We went through investigations. We destroyed our brand. And when I say we, we did it as a group. Over the last year, we have brought two great new board members into our governing board. We have a superintendent who has restored faith and confidence. And President Beckman, over the years that I've known you, you've been a friend, a partner, a cohort in efforts. You've always been a leader. And I want to tell you that you are a natural leader, but you're also a dis disciplined leader who is going to do a superb job for our district. I want to thank you for the commitment that you have made to govern in, a, in an era where a lot of people walked away. One of the reasons that you're the president tonight is that Vice President Beckham made a really remarkable decision a week ago. I've always thought of you as an independent thinker who looked at things in your own way. And as I listened, re-listened to the videotape and listened to your decision about, or the explanation of your decision, of why you chose to defer a nomination that most people would have jumped at, I was impressed once again with the impact of your independent thought. And I want to thank you for becoming the Vice President and supporting Patty Beck Beckman. Thank you very much. Dr. Kreekhart, you didn't need this job. I know that. You could have been playing golf and on the beaches a lot more often. And I thank you for what you've done. From the community stand side, standpoint, we're still bumped and bruised. We've still got a lot of nasty thoughts floating around. But there's a powerful feeling going through the community right now that I can't speak for it in its entirety, although that never stops me. I do it anyway. We feel a sense of hope, we feel a sense of optimism, and we want to support our district again. I promise you that you have my support, and that includes everyone on this governing board, including those who, uh, whose feelings I heard last year. Please accept my apology and accept my support. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Ambry. Good evening. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Chris Ambry, and as president of the SEA, I stand here to express confidence. We, the Scottsdale Education Association, have confidence in us. We have confidence in you, Dr. Creeker, and we have confidence in you, all the members of the governing board, and of course, Sandra. We are so excited about the start of this new board and we truly, truly appreciate the changes that have been happening in this district. We will continue to focus on moving our district forward in the most positive of manners. And as always, we will also continue to focus our every efforts on every student we have the privilege to be with in our classrooms 
every day. As professional educators, our goal is not just to instruct, but to inspire. We are also inspired to make Scottsdale the destination district once again. To do this, let's look to the very heart of our district, our teachers that I am so very proud to represent. To do this, I respectfully ask that the SEA once again be recognized as the voice of that heart. Education is a team sport, and we're all on the same team. Thank you. Wally Graham. Thank you. Uh, good evening and Happy New Year, President Beckman, uh, Dr. Kriegar, uh, board members, uh, staff, parents, residents, and guests. I'm, I'm up here tonight. Uh, I represent the Arcadia Osborne Neighborhood Association. And uh, you all have several properties that are jewels in our boundaries. The Arcadia High School, the um, Ingleside Middle School and a jewel called Tavon Elementary, which is an A-level school again. And we're thankful to have those um, uh, facilities in our neighborhood because they attract people. Our neighborhood is turning over. We're getting younger families. Uh, we have more people coming in now with kids who can go and can be attracted to the Scottsdale Unified School District schools. My reason for being here tonight is that uh, for two years, my neighbors and I have worked on the um, old administrative um, um, facilities lot. Uh, you all initially sold it to a developer who wanted to put 120 apartments and uh, bringing in 200 and some odd cars into our neighborhoods, and we were concerned. We thought that uh, they went away. We now have a great uh, partner in the Hospice of the Valley. We've worked with them for almost a year. We're very, very pleased with what they've done. They've listened to our concerns about um, height, about density, about traffic, et cetera. My disappointment uh, is we're really with the district. Um, you all have not been involved in a key item that we have been pushing. And what we've been pushing is safety in and around the schools in our, in our area. We have um, successfully gotten a, a MAG grant on 56th Street, for example, near the Ingleside Middle School. We're working uh, and we want to push you all to do things that talk about what will happen in the Arcadia parking lot once the uh, Hospice of the Valley is there. We have not gotten one person from this district in administration to stand up and talk about the design. You all have not done that in a public meeting, and that saddens me, because here we are, neighbors out there pushing for student safety, and you all have not been involved. So I'd like for you to up the involvement in those public meetings so you can take a look at the design to make sure it works for us in terms of neighborhood cut-throughs. We've got people going through an alley behind the um, Piccadilly Road, it's called, Piccadilly Avenue. They drive through the alley just to go up north to get to and avoid the traffic. We need you all to help us with redesign of traffic flows around our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Okay, we now move to agenda item eight, the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Uh, President Beckham, if I may, uh, please. Uh, I would like to suggest an amendment to, to uh, item L, the authorization of the Vice President's electronic signature. And I'd like to amend that so that it states authorization of President's electronic signature for board approved contract. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as modified. So moved. Second. Get the second first oh. and then have discussion. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll second. Okay. okay. Board Member Perleberg seconds. Yep. Board Member Beckham. Um, 
Do we need to have an explanation on record or not? Or does any of the other board members, since we're so changing that particular is, item before you vote on it, um, or has it been, has it been dis the, inf the information been disseminated down to other board members? So the, the, the question was, is there is, does there need to be an explanation for that? I'd be happy to give one uh, from my viewpoint. Um, historically, for common, um, for contracts like employment contracts, not talking about contracts with uh, major vendors or, or other companies. Uh, we have a signature on file uh, that is then used to confirm a board vote uh, and use, for example, with employment contracts, we are, we are offering contracts all year long. It's, a, it's, an, ongoing, it's an ongoing thing. Um, Different districts uh, do that in, in different ways. Some have a position called clerk rather than a vice president, and the, and the clerk sign has an electronic signature for uh, those contracts. Uh, we've used the vice president role to do that. It doesn't have to be. Many districts use uh, the president's signature for those contracts. Uh, so uh, after discussion uh, this week, uh, we thought it best uh, to go with the president's signature. It's uh, clearly part of the of the role of the president, so that's why we're offering that. Okay, Barbara, um, board member Perleberg had <laughs> seconded the motion. Um, so, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes five to zero. Now we move to uh, the remaining agenda, action item nine. A, approve the revisions to the governing board policy, GCK professional staff assignments and transfers. Uh, before I introduce uh, uh, Mrs. Marshall uh, to uh, answer questions on this, uh, I want again to say publicly, as we've said, as we go through these uh, uh, personnel policies, that uh, this is part of our routine of going through this section of the policy book. Uh, the, having the approval of these uh, revisions that deal with assignments and transfers is coincidental. It is, it is not intentional because we are preparing any action uh, other than our normal staffing procedures. So, uh, so with, with that, I would introduce uh, Michelle Marshall, our general counsel. Thank you, Dr. Creekard. Uh, President Beck Men, <laughs> members of the board, Dr. Creekard and Sandra, I will get it, I will get used to it, I promise. Um, I have brought back for a second read policy GCK, which is entitled Professional Staff Assignments and Transfers. If you will recall, I uh, brought this for a first read to you last month. Um, and uh, there were not a lot of comments and um, no changes requested, so I'm bringing it back to you. But I have had some discussion um, regarding um, clarifications, so I'm going to talk about those. And then um, for your information, I also have the regulation in your background materials. Um, the regulation is brand new. We, I did provide it to you uh, in December, but... Um, we have not had this regulation before, and since it is quite comprehensive, wanted to make sure you were aware of what we were doing to put in a uh, regulation to implement the policy. One question that I did receive last time from at least one board member was whether the regulation should be a regulation or whether it was more appropriate for the certified employee handbook. Um, at that time, it was my opinion and still is my opinion that it should be a regulation. Uh, my main reason for that is the regulation is uh, accompanied with the policy. It's, it's um, where people know to look for our policies and regulations. It's available online. It's the most easily accessible. And as we're rolling out the employee, uh, the certified employee handbook, I just think it's not as obvious to our public and other constituents um, that they could find these regulations there. So it's still my recommendation that it be a regulation, and I know that is um, also the opinion of our HR uh, staff. 
um, as well as our HR consultant. Um, to review the, the questions that I received um, offline about the policy itself, um, I was asked about this language here. Sorry? Oh, um, under transfers. It says that a teacher who has been employed by the school district for the major portion of three or more consecutive school years and who is designated in the lowest performance classification for two consecutive school years shall not be transferred as a teacher to another school um, in the school district unless the district has first issued a notice of inadequacy of classroom performance and approved a performance improvement plan for the teacher pursuant to ARS 15-539 and the governing board has approved the new placement as in the best interest of the pupils in the school. Um, and, and the last part of that section is a teacher shall not be transferred more than once pursuant to ARS 15-537. So this part that I've highlighted here. That's a mouthful. Um, the question I received was, what is this major portion of three or more consecutive school years? Why do we have to have that? That's confusing. Are we going to have uh, people questioning what's the major portion? Um, all of the language that I've highlighted is directly from ARS 15-537. And um, that major portion of three or more consecutive school years is how the statutes define what we call a continuing teacher. Um, so it's well settled uh, state statute as well as the case law defining what that means that it's 50% uh, plus one day um, of duty days. So um, our certified staff understand it. It's been in place for a long time. Um, so although it may sound a little confusing to those who don't have to deal with this language all the time, it's um, not going to be, it shouldn't be surprising to our teachers or other staff. Um, the other part of the question that I received, which is a good one as well, is that part about the governing board approving uh, the transfer of a teacher who's in that situation where they've been placed on an improvement plan. And the question was, well, um, how are we making sure that the board knows that that's the situation? You know, we have a huge consent agenda that just says, here's the transfers, here's the assignments. Um, and so it was suggested that we add some language. Um, I, it just happened today, so I don't have it in the document for you. Um, but I would suggest adding um, right after, right here, before it says a teacher shall not be transferred more than once pursuant to the statute, I would add the language, um, the governing board shall be notified in advance of approving such transfers. Um, so if you are otherwise ready to approve this uh, policy as a second read, I can add that and your motion can um, just state that it's amended as um, discussed in um, tonight's meeting. With that, before I go to the regulation, are there any questions about the policy? I think there might be one, Mrs. Beckman. Oh, Board Member Greenberg. Apologies, uh, I don't mean to draw this out. For teaching assignments, is there any way for a teacher to uh, challenge the assignment or to, to I don't ask for a reprieve? I, I, in other words, if, if a teacher is told that they are going to be assigned part time, you know, between two schools or, or what have you, perhaps this isn't the correct policy on this matter, but the way I read it, it sounds like it is. If it is determined that it is in the best interest of the school district to have a teacher teach between two different schools, is there any way for that teacher to challenge that and say that, that what is in paper looks good is not in reality what works? or? anything to that effect, if, if that makes sense. I apologize. Right. Teacher, teacher assignments are, are made uh, by principals primarily or the supervisor, in the case you say of traveling teachers, for example, maybe a, a, a speech path uh, would travel between a couple of schools and, and the, the director of special ed would, would be making those assignments. There, we, we recommend highly that there are discussions that take place on assignments at, at most schools. Uh, when it comes to the spring and the scheduling, and, and if school has uh, is going to be cut one section at third grade, but adding a section in fourth grade, they usually talk to the, those teachers and say, "Who would who would like to go to the fourth grade to do that?" If in the end there there is uh, disagreement, 
that can be appealed through a normal appeal process, calling uh, the supervisor. Uh, ultimately, though, uh, the language uh, has been in place for a long time that the ultimate decision is the superintendent's decision in, in uh, assignment. But always a willingness to listen and appeal. If it is, if it is something uh, more egregious in the, pre in the procedure itself, then we do have a grievance policy as well. Any other questions? So do I make a motion to approve the agenda item as modified? No, because we just modified the, the regulation and you're, okay. you're just approving the policy. Sorry, no, that was policy. So that's correct. Um, so. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I apologize. No, that's okay. Um, I, yes, so yes. would do a. So yes, okay. as, as modified. <laughs> okay. Do I have a motion to approve uh, agenda item 9A, approval of the revisions to governing board policy GCK, professional staff <coughs> assignments and transfers, as modified? So moved. A second? Second. Board second. member Kravitz seconds. Um, I a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> motion passes 5 to 0. Thank you. And just before you move on, um, another suggestion um, that that we will probably um, go ahead and just do with the regulation is this first uh, uh, sentence here that talks about the teacher teacher initiated uh, transfer process. Um, it starts the the regulation starts with that sentence that the um, that particular teacher initiated process. Um, does not apply to anybody who's on an improvement or remediation plan. It was suggested that we move it down to the actual section about teacher-initiated transfer requests. We'll probably just go ahead and do that, just for your information. Thank you. Okay, we move on to agenda item 10, future items. Do I have any requests for future agenda items from board members? Board member Greenberg. Uh, my light was permanently on again, so I apologize, Sandy, because I believe you had certainly clicked it first there. Um, yes, I was asked to um, list a, a few items that I had requested from uh, Superintendent Creekard. Um, I believe the first one, discussion item for uh, an internal auditing department and policy DIE, um, that is probably something that could be discussed alongside other uh, desires or wishes for expenses that we had discussed earlier uh, with Dr. Creekard and Mr. Gadd. Uh, I would also like to have a time to discuss a time change for public comments at regular board meetings. Um, I would like to have a discussion uh, to discuss holding two regular board meetings each month instead of a work study session and a regular board meeting. The work study session to be moved to a regular board meeting as well. Um, I would like to discuss uh, governing board recognition of the Scottsdale Education Association and permitting the district to enter a meet and confer process with the Scottsdale Education Association uh, or the labor organization of the teacher's choice. And uh, that would be it at this time. Thank you. Okay. Board member Kravitz. Thank you. I just want to make sure we are on schedule for discussing a uh, change to bell schedules and bus schedules. Um, I don't recall exactly which month we said we were discussing and I thought it was February, but I may be mistaken. We, ha we have been discussing that, but we'll have another discussion and I will inform you in the weekly memo where we are on that. Okay. But we will have that. We, we, are, ha we are having that discussion. So yes. we'll, we'll have enough uh, war, uh, I don't want to say warning, that sounds negative. We'll have enough uh, lead time yes. so that it could be something. To, yes, that's one of the for considerations. The, okay, yes. for next year. And then we will also be having a discussion regarding stipends for teachers uh, that sponsor extracurricular activities. And I'm just curious as to when that might that be is, happening that as is, well. That uh, is on Dr. Bowman's list, yes. Is so that a time frame for that? Uh, I don't know. He had to leave. Uh, Amy Eveleth, you know what Dr. Bowman's time frame might be for looking at supplemental pay stipends? Oh, we're working on the supplemental pay stipends? Yes. I know that that's part of the 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. And like a financial policy for our cash accounts and our, um, what do they call the other accounts again? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and our budget controlled funds, that will be coming to us when? Mar March, I believe. Okay. March. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right. I have a few items as well. I would like for consideration to have a discussion, uh, facilities discussion. I would also like to review the board policy regarding the placement of public comment on the agenda. I would like to discuss the superintendent search and our act acting superintendent, Dr. John Cricard's contract. I would also like to dis ha discuss the possibility of having a board evaluation. Okay, anything else? Anyway, board member Kravitz. No. <laughs> Board Member Beckham. I'll save my future, I'll save my future items for next uh, board meeting, but I do have something I want to say before we um, adjourn. So is, would this be the appropriate time? Okay. <laughs> we have governing board. Oh, we have governing oh, board uh -huh. reports. Okay. Thank Report. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item 11, dates of upcoming meetings. Tuesday, January 22nd, 2019, 8.30 a.m., Governing Board Retreat at the MDA. Thursday, February 7th, 2019, 3 p.m., a special meeting at the MDA. Tuesday, February 12th, 2019, 5 p.m., a regular Governing Board meeting at Coronado High School. Yeah, 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 no, 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 no. She didn't say 19. She said 12. <laughs> okay, moving on to agenda item 12, governing board reports. Do we have any governing board reports or comments? Board member Beckham. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to note in our consent agenda, we had every month we have acceptance of gifts. And this particular month we had um, a very generous gift that I'd like to acknowledge and to thank the Karis Charitable Trust Funds for the general account went into the general gift account, but the funds will be purchasing, uh, I believe, almost 1,400 calculators and mathematical materials for the entire district, and something I don't believe that we've had in the past. And I would also like to um, just acknowledge those people who um, were involved in procuring those, those funds. So thank you so much. And then secondarily, um, the Arcadia PTO for the generous um, funds that they are donating to help uh, Arcadia at this time. That was also on the agenda. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Board Member Beckham makes the motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. Board Member Kravitz, second. The motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Um, that adjourns us at 7.56 p.m.